that if we entrust this nation to Joe, he will do for your family what he did for ours. Bring us together and make us whole. Good evening. I'm Chuck Todd and welcome to NBC News' special coverage of the 2020 Democratic National Convention on NBC News Now. Those were some of the highlights from last evening. Right now, we are less than an hour from the start of what's going to be a huge night and an historic one. Folks, regardless of your politics, these are the kinds of moments that are etched in the history books and excerpts that you will see in convention's future. So in just a few hours, Kamala Harris will accept the Democratic Party's nomination to be the Vice President of the United States, making her the first woman of color to officially join a major party's presidential ticket in a country that has not only never elected a black woman president or vice president, but has never elected a black woman as governor either. Harris is only the second black woman to be elected to the U.S. Senate. Tonight, she becomes a vice presidential nominee. According to just released excerpts from her address, Harris is gonna talk about her upbringing, upbringing, being the daughter of two immigrants, Joe Biden, and of course, Donald Trump. And then the other big speaker tonight, we are also gonna hear from President Obama, who is going to deliver remarks that will be highly critical of President Trump, tying him to 170,000 COVID deaths in this country, while also portraying him as incapable of fulfilling the basic functions of high office. President Obama will speak tonight live from the Museum of, um, of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, a location that Democrats say is intended to underscore the Biden campaign's argument that American democracy itself is on the line in this election. But those are two big names. The rest of the list is pretty big, too. Tonight, we're also going to hear from Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party's last presidential nominee, Hillary Clinton, as well as, of course, Elizabeth Warren. So as we gear up for tonight's convention, the spotlight is going to be on Kamala Harris. This is her night. But the most memorable moments could very well come from President Obama, because in many ways, they could be what gets under the skin of President Trump. Joining me now from Wilmington, Delaware, are my NBC News colleagues, Kristen Welker and Mike Memoli. And Mike, let me start with you and a preview of what we expect to hear from Kamala Harris. Well, Chuck, as you know, with any vice presidential acceptance speech, there are really two imperatives. One is to introduce that new candidate to the country. And second is to prosecute the case against the challenger on the other side. Now, for Kamala Harris, of course, prosecuting the case was central to really the argument a lot of her supporters were making to put her on the ticket. We saw her do that in the context of uh, confirmation hearings, of, of hearings on Capitol Hill and Judiciary Committee. And she's going to do that tonight. She's going to talk about Donald Trump using political, tra abusing tragedies as political weapons where Joe Biden would turn our crises into purpose. But I think you know, Chuck, that the biography is so important to how they're framing this night. She's going to be introducing herself as the children of immigrants. Inclusion is the word that Biden and Harris aides are using so much tonight. I think it's e pluribus unum night at the Democratic National Convention. They want to highlight the diversity of the Democratic Party, but also of the country and make the argument that that diversity is what gives this country strength. And she, as much as anybody, can represent that just herself. And Mike, it does seem as if they believe in some ways Kamala Harris is a Swiss Army life in that she could be talking to Caribbean voters in Florida, Latino voters in Arizona, suburban um, women in uh, Grand Rapids, that there is, that they hope her story connects in that way. It isn't just about a black woman, an Indian American, that, that she speaks, that a lot of other groups sort of identify with her experience. Is that, is that, it seems like that's what they're hoping here. No, I love that term, Chuck, because this whole Democratic convention for the Biden campaign is about really just shoring up the two pillars of what they believe is the Biden coalition. That includes African-American voters, which put him into this position as the Democratic nominee. But it also includes, not to be overlooked, suburban moderates. That's why we've seen so much focus in the last two nights right. on Republicans and former Republicans making those appeal. But Kamala Harris, they believe, can do, no, can do both, of course. As a woman of color, she's going to energize and already has energized the Democratic Party behind Joe Biden. But they also do think that personal story and just her own charisma, her own connection to voters can sell in those swing districts that help put Democrats in charge of the House in 2018. And they believe will put Joe Biden and Kamala Harris into the White House in 2020. 
All right, uh, Kristen Welker, if Kamala Harris's speech lives long in history, and I think it will, what could be a bigger impact short term, even if it doesn't live long, is President Obama's speech tonight. He's got to directly name check President Trump in ways we've never seen him do before. Uh, you and I both know how this will get under the president's skin and will likely, this is one of those speeches that I have this feeling this is going to resonate because Donald Trump will make it resonate. Tell us a little bit about this speech. I wouldn't be surprised if we got some swift reaction on Twitter from Donald Trump. You're absolutely right about that, Chuck. This is going to be President Obama's most forceful indictment, indictment yet of President Trump. He's going to compare this White House to a reality show. Uh, and again, he's going to try to make the case that our very democracy is at stake as he speaks from Philadelphia later on this evening. And it's such a critical speech, Chuck, because if you think about what former President Bill Clinton did for Barack Obama back in 2012, he was called the explainer in chief. Right. In some ways, President Obama is taking on a similar mantle. He is going to be the one who bears witness to what it takes to not only be in the Oval Office to right. serve as president, but what it takes to lead a country in crisis. And so I think you are going to hear him make some of these key arguments. And Chuck, he's also going to make the case for this history-making ticket. He's going to talk about Joe Biden. He's going to talk about Senator Kamala Harris. He's going to talk about his firsthand experience of working with Joe Biden to help revive an economy in recession, to help to get health care passed, one of the critical moments of the Obama White House. And then he's going to, in very practical terms, do what his wife did, Chuck, which is go that he is going to urge people to get out and vote, particularly against the backdrop of President Trump raising all sorts of questions about the legitimacy of this election, because he sees that as so critical and vital to this democracy. So I think that this speech is going to run the gamut. And as you say, Chuck, I think that it will be one of the most important for former President Obama that we have seen. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Bill Clinton 2012 speech. The Bill Clinton of then was politically still very potent. He may be less potent today, but he was very potent then. And I would argue the peak of Barack Obama's post-presidential powers are probably right now. Um, and it's a big, it could be a big, big deal. Uh, Mike Memoli, Kristen Welker, getting us started from Wilmington, Delaware. Thank you both. Joining me now is my NBC News colleague, Casey Hunt. She's also host of KCDC Sundays on MSNBC. Also with us, Jennifer Palmieri, former communications director for both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And Donna Edwards, former Democratic Congresswoman from Maryland. Um, Donna, I want to start with you on Kamala Harris. And tell me what this means to you. Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, we've all said it's an historic moment. But, I mean, for me, I mean, I feel the swelling um, with uh, Kamala Harris uh, tonight speaking on stage as a black woman, um, you know, knowing that we're in our centennial year um, of a woman's right to vote and knowing how far black women have come in that process and to have her on center stage tonight it's almost overwhelming. And I've heard that from so many of my friends and family um, who are feeling the same sense of both uh, pride, but also elation um, at this prospect and just can't wait to vote come November 3rd. You know, Donna, I, it's it, these moments, you know, she's gonna be so much bigger after tonight uh, of a household name you know, I don't know how you prepare somebody for that. No matter how prepared you think you are, you know, we know after tonight, it, everything changes. Well, it really does. And, you know, the interesting thing, people have been struggling with different ways to pronounce her name. Everyone will know um, <laughs> yeah. from tonight going forward that her name is Kamala Harris, and they will know her story, and they will be able to repeat her story, and they will feel that in their life experiences, they've lived her story as well. And so I think it's a really important moment. And frankly, uh, tonight is sort of a blockbuster of Democrats yeah, on stage uh, tonight, leading up uh, to having Kamala Harris take center stage. In fact, I want to, I want to, Casey, I want to turn to Barack Obama here a minute, um, because the former president, I, I want to play an excerpt from the John Lewis um, uh, funeral 
because on that, it was that day, that morning, Donald Trump floated the idea that he was going to delay the election, question mark. And whether that inspired a more pointed, pointed response or not, we'll never know. But I think that context matters when we hear this excerpt right now from former President Obama from three weeks ago. Bull Connor may be gone, but today we witness with our own eyes police officers kneeling on the necks of black Americans. George Wallace may be gone, but we can witness our federal government sending agents to use tear gas and batons against peaceful demonstrators. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting by closing polling locations and targeting minorities and students with restrictive ID laws and attacking our voting rights with surgical precision, even undermining the Postal Service in the run-up to an election that's going to be dependent on mail-in ballots so people don't get sick. Now, Casey, we're not going to see an applause, I don't think, for tonight because of, yeah. of social distancing issues. But I play those excerpts because I feel like we're going to hear um, portions or, or at least um, thoughts like that tonight. Yeah, Chuck, I, I was struck looking at that uh, masked, obviously, uh, for safety crowd of people and thinking back to, you know, some of the other times in the Obama presidency when he uh, touched on themes that clearly resonated in a similar way uh, when he sang Amazing Grace uh, at Charleston is, is another uh, instance of, of when we have seen President Obama speaking in a church about politics mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that those two things are so tied together for him, for that community, and what that means in the broader scope of all of this. And I, I think you're right that he may be at the height uh, of, it, of his post-presidency uh, in terms of, of speaking to the audience that, that got out to vote for him. I mean, I remember going to his rallies and the don't, don't boo vote cheers, and the reality was that left that stadium where he was speaking and was something that we saw people actually go out and do for him twice. And, you know, a lot of those people didn't didn't go to the polls in 2016. And I mm -hmm. think that's a big part of why they see Kamala Harris as being so important here. Right. So, you know, I think that the challenge is obviously the forum is a lot different. That's not to say President Obama doesn't bring a unique set of strength as strengths as a politician right. to a format that's not uh, strictly a crowd. Um, but I, I do think that we're going to we, we can't there is no world in which he does not go after Donald Trump, even if he doesn't actually use his name very much, Chuck. Well, we already know that he's already using his name, which we but normally we haven't seen him do a lot. He didn't do. He actually never used the president's name in those remarks uh, at John Lewis's memorial service. Jennifer Palmieri, what do you do? You think the the Bill Clinton 2012 comparison is an apt one here? I do. I mean, it's one of the, there's so, there's not much we can point to in terms of precedent this year, but I do think that that is one example of it. And, um, you know, I worked with President Obama. You know his style well, Chuck. He does. He has, in his post presidency, he has hesitated to involve himself directly in taking on Trump unless he felt that the democracy was truly at stake. And I mean, look around us all on our Zoom calls, you know participating with you. We are in the middle of a pandemic of a extraordinary economic meltdown. And he, you, you, you saw Mrs. Obama a couple of nights ago take Trump on directly, saw her speak very frankly about, you know, what she, you know, she told us, she cued us and said, this is what I want you to take away. Listen to me. <laughs> it can get worse and it will. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, the same kind of raising of the stakes from him. But in 2016, both Obamas were a little loath to engage him directly. They wanted right. to stay somewhere above the fray, not because they were scared to fight, but because they thought that was more effective. And we're at the, you know, I'm going to be colloquial, but like, who are we kidding phase of this where you just have to, they, I think they think they have to speak very plainly. And I was surprised at the John Lewis funeral that President Obama, he had a 
the agenda. He came to that. He came. Yeah. He gave a. You know, well, these are usually these are a place where you not just leave politics, but you leave policy behind. And he had a five point agenda of what he wanted Americans to do um, to make sure that their vote yeah. was going to be counted. And you know, I think this is what you're going to see from both of them from now to right. November. You know, Donna Edwards, I, I think John Lewis would have called what President Obama did at his service good trouble. Uh, in, in, in some ways, it's probably what um, what do you how how aggressive how how strong of a case do you hope Barack Obama makes against Donald Trump, Donna? Well, you know, I mean, I hope that he makes um, a really compelling one that's very direct. I think one of the things that we've come to learn about both Obamas uh, in their in the post presidency is that they are very plain spoken when it comes to um, talking about issues of concern and speaking their mind. I think we saw that from Michelle Obama on Monday. She didn't want to leave any possibility that her words could be misinterpreted, and she was very direct. I think that we can expect the same thing from President Obama tonight. And uh, also to recognize the moment that we're in, I think that he is going to both offer, you know, kind of a sobering assessment of this presidency, yeah. and he's going to let us know what could happen if we don't do the right thing and vote this guy out of office. It is worth noting he is the second most popular politician in this country if you count Michelle Obama as a politician. If you don't, He's the most popular right now these days. Anyway, Casey, uh, Jen, and Donna, stick around with us. Up ahead, I'm going to talk with Congressman Jim Clyburn, who arguably changed everything for the Biden campaign with his endorsement. He'll join me next. Plus, how much does the running mate really matter to the ticket? Kornacki is at the big board to show us by the numbers. That's next. But first, all this hour, we're, of course, going to be taking a look back at some memorable Democratic convention moments. And on this night, none seem more appropriate than this one from 1984, when Geraldine Ferraro became the first woman to accept any major party's nomination for vice president. By choosing a woman to run for our nation's second highest office, you send a powerful signal to all Americans. There are no doors we cannot unlock. We will place no limits on achievement. If we can do this, we can do anything. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Welcome back to NBC News Now. Special coverage of night three of the Democratic National Convention. As we said, tonight is a huge night. It's Kamala Harris's big night. She will make history as the first woman of color to accept a major party's nomination for vice president. Despite the historic nature of this moment, how much do running mates really matter? History shows us that generally, while bad ones can be detrimental to a campaign, good ones also do little to help. Will 2020 change that? Joining me now to discuss the impact or lack thereof of past running mates is our own NBC News national political correspondent, Steve Kornacki, at the big board. And you know my favorite punchline on this, if running mates mattered, Michael Dukakis would have been president <laughs> in 1988. But walk us through this. Yeah, that's probably the ultimate reality check on these. Let's look at this from a couple of different directions, though. First, the most direct, kind of literal way a running mate could help a ticket. Uh, does the ticket carry the running mate state? when it otherwise wouldn't have. Let me give you the most famous example of this. Remember these two, JFK, LBJ, yep. Boston and Austin, 1960. And of course, with LBJ on the ticket, John F. Kennedy carried Texas, very slim margin there. Uh, and the combination of Texas and just a couple thousand votes there in Illinois, that was enough to make JFK president. Probably does not get Texas without LBJ on the ticket. Since then, though, that was 60 years ago. Since then, can we find another example like that? We were looking today. I think I found one. How about this? Carter and Mondale. 1980, yeah. the Carter Mondale ticket wins Minnesota. <laughs> they don't win much else. Minnesota really yeah, sticks yeah. out and there, Georgia. you can see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Georgia Carter's home state. So, yeah, you know, there's Mondale carrying the state. It didn't matter. That's really the last example we can find of that. So then there's the other question there. Uh, it's the more broad kind of uh, thematically, does the vice president enhance the public's image of the presidential candidate, kind of make the ticket as a whole more appealing? What you got here, so these are going back to 1988 here. This is a combination of a couple different polls. The basic question was asked, asked uh, when the running mate was picked, does this make you more or less likely to vote for the ticket? So you can see the leading, the top one here, the top pick was Al Gore by Bill Clinton in 92. 25 points more likely, voters said, uh, when that ticket came in uh, uh, to vote for uh, Clinton. What's amazing is who's number two. I would have guessed that Gore was the most helpful. That is is likely. I would have put Lieberman as, as uh, I would have guessed Lieberman or Benson. I'm shocked that it's Jack Kemp, considering it ended up being a lo yeah. losing ticket. And look at your list there, by the way. Only one of the first six won. Yeah, and, and you get to the end of this, you know, we, we yeah. just show you at the very end here, you know, Dan Quayle, oh, that was, look at this, the Dan Quayle race, 21% said they had a negative view of Bush Quayle, but they voted for Bush anyway. So that's the worst possible VP pick just in terms of the, the polling in the campaign was Quayle, and yet the folks who had reservations broke more for Bush than Dukakis in that race. But there's maybe one other way that she could, we might look back and say, is she helping? We've done the issue of turnout. And, you know, if suddenly the, the West Indies vote in, in South Florida, Caribbean vote, um, already you hear reports that Kamala Harris's Jamaican uh, background is resonating with voters there. So there might be other ways where we measure her impact, right? Right. No, and you can get to election day. Remember in 2000 with Joe Lieberman and Florida for Democrats, there was some thought there that Lieberman's presence, the first Jewish vice presidential nominee, could get votes for Gore in Florida. There are still some Democrats who say Palm Beach County, Florida, that mm -hmm. Lieberman did get them those votes just because the right. design of the ballot, they voted for Buchanan by accident. Steve Kornacki, what an excellent, uh, excellent set of numbers today. And I love that 
I love that VP chart. I had not seen that before. Nice work, sir. Thanks. And it's good to see that we have the, the 1960 data in our big boards. <laughs> there it that, is. That is fantastic. Well done. Thanks, John. Uh, joining me now is one of Joe Biden's probably most important supporters right now in Congress and anywhere else. It's Jim Clyburn of South Carolina. Since helping Biden win the South Carolina primary and gain the momentum that led him to the nomination, Clyburn has since advised Biden on a running mate pick. Here's what he told me a few days uh, before the pick was made about what he'd like to see from Joe Biden. Take a listen. Joe Biden is a guy full of compassion. Uh, he has much more compassion than he exhibits passion. So he, need, he needs to run a mate with a lot of passion to connect the voters. And Congressman Clyburn joins me now. Congressman, I see you smiling. You know, the second you said that to us, all of us in our Meet the Press newsroom, you know, Slack, we're all going, huh, all right, who's he talking about? Is he talking about Kamala? Well? Well, I suspect maybe I was. Considering <laughs> <laughs> whether it's going to come to pass, so she is very passionate. No question about that. Uh, we saw that throughout uh, her uh, campaigns uh, out there in California. But I think she demonstrated that in the presidential as well. Uh, that first debate, there's a lot of passion in that question. So uh, that she offered uh, up to Joe Biden, uh, that um, uh, took him off stride. Uh, she's demonstrated uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee in the questions of law uh, and uh, as well uh, as uh, other uh, questions she's had. Uh, of other candidates, uh, or you might say people uh, pursuing their office, especially the Supreme Court uh, Justice. So she is a very passionate person, and I think he could not have made a better pick. What what would be your um, what would be your concern about sort of? Um, let me ask you this way. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions that Kamala Harris, just having her on the ticket, it's going to excite African-American voters. But just simply making the pick isn't going to do it. What, what else needs to be done, do you think, to excite particularly younger African-American voters? Well, you know, we have a saying down here in the South. Uh, we say, you know, you can tick the hogs to the top, but you can't make them jump. And so what we've got to do, uh, go back to the job. He's named her, he's running mate, and she now has to do her job, and I think she will. Uh, that was, that's the next thing. I mean, there's nothing else he can do. Uh, he can't uh, do the debating for her, he can't do the campaign for her. She's got to do that herself, and I am confident that she will fit herself well. I am enthusiastic about this bit. Congressman Jim Clymer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cut this short. We have a little bit of an audio issue uh, on our end, but I think we caught those first two answers. Always a pleasure to have you on, sir, uh, and enjoy the Thank rest you. of the convention. You got it. The panel the panel is still with me, Casey, Jen, uh, and Donna. And Casey, you know, to go to this issue of passion, right? That that he brought up. Um, what 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 is that? What do you think that's going to look like tonight? What does passion from Kamala Harris look like tonight? Well, Chuck, we got a little bit of a preview when she stepped out with Joe Biden when she was first announced. And you know, anyone that's covered or, or watched Kamala Harris uh, in settings like this, I mean, this is a, a strange one because it still will be virtual without the crowd. Uh, but she is pretty effective at combining both sharp prosecutorial attacks with the persona that is authentic to her, which is uh, warm, open, quick to laugh, uh, somebody that connects on a personal level as well as in the room. So, you know, I think that she combines those things together in a way that, yes, the format is going to be challenging as it's been challenging for everyone else. But I, I think that it will be very transparent how she personally feels about all of this, mm -hmm. both being the first uh, African-American woman to get this nomination and also how she feels 
about President Trump. And uh, having covered Kamala Harris in the past, I'd be surprised if that doesn't show through in a way that would reflect what Congressman Clyburn was talking about right then. You know, Jen, it's interesting. On, on Casey brought up the format, right? In some ways, you know, it's tough to have a rousing speech. I feel like the person that has figured out that figured out this format brilliantly is Michelle Obama. You know, it was an intimate one-on-one. -on -one. It felt like she was talking to you individually, intimate one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think it's sometimes harder to do the big, broad speech without an audience. Yeah, I mean, Michelle Obama, it's like you didn't want to dare turn away because no. you, you felt that you were in this conversation with you and she was deadly serious about it. I'm interested to see what this looks like in terms of the, the stage, because this is the stage that was supposed to be in Milwaukee. This is the... Oh, you know, they were the, the trucks were on their way to Milwaukee, and then they got the call to say, "Come to Delaware." And they built a mini version of it in the Chase Center in in Wilmington. So it could be it could I you know I have no idea what it looks like, but it it could be challenging for her if she is. I, you know, Gretchen Whitmer the other night was at a podium, um, and then you contrast that to Michelle Obama um, speaking, um, you know, or even the, the speeches that we saw from outside, I thought were easier, came across better, and were sort of easier for the audience, television audience to absorb than something at a podium. So that could be, you know, that, that kind of like that could be hard to translate. Donna, you probably have more experience than any of us here when it comes to speaking in front of a crowd, trying to have a, a, a distant conversation, a more one-on-one, -on -one, the more intimate feel. I, this is one aspect of tonight that I think is an extra challenge. Well, I think it is. I mean, I spoke at the 2012 convention on that big stage. And, you know, when you're delivering a speech like that, you love the feedback that you're getting from an mm -hmm. audience. And so this is going to be a, a little bit different. But here's where I think it actually could work. Uh, for Kamala Harris. Her, part of her job tonight is also introducing herself to people. And what better way to introduce yourself to be in their living rooms and in their kitchens and in their dens, um, you know, while you're uh, talking with them. And so I actually think that could work uh, to her advantage so that uh, the American people can get to see a little bit of her personality and who she is. Um, I do think it, you know, it, it matters what the setup is, but I suspect that she is going to seize this moment. She knows that it's a big moment. She knows that she has to connect on the big issues, challenging Donald Trump, but at the same time, making sure that she comes across to the American people as somebody who's ready to be on this big stage. Jen, I wouldn't want to let this go. You've written very passionately about women in politics and working ever since the end of the Clinton campaign. And I wanted to get your reaction to something that I thought was really in tr uh, a really interesting take uh, about how Kamala Harris is the first, you know, she may be the third woman VP nominee, but she's the first VP nominee that isn't being asked to rescue a, a, a ticket that's losing. And that yeah. it's really <laughs> important that, you know, before, you know, Geraldine Ferraro and Sarah Palin were like, hey, help us, help rescue us, that it was almost unfair. In this case, this is where Kamala Harris isn't, isn't already being penalized with when she's being picked. Right. It's, 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 this happens with failing companies. That women become CEOs when a company is failing. And then with, right. the, and with Palin and Ferraro, they, they were, we, we need a Hail Mary to see if we right. can do something that grants this ticket. And that's what they tried to do. But, the, but then at the same time, I think, I imagine that Kamala Harris feels the additional pressure, right? I, Biden can't go up much higher in the polls. It's just, no. it's, it's not possible. So I, I, I was, uh, you know, for, for her sake, I'm sure she was quite relieved to see that there actually was a bounce um, from right. for her uh, because, you know, I wasn't sure that if that was going to materialize. But at the same time, she takes this this um, mm -hmm. stage night with the gravity of a really good chance that she's going to become that first um, woman vice president. And Casey, you know, the traditional role of the running mate is to, quote unquote, be the one that's on the attack, be the prosecutor. Um, Kamala Harris on uh, Capitol Hill has not been afraid of that role. She hasn't at all, Chuck. And in many ways, it's been a very natural role for her. And, you know, she also, and Jen has written a lot about this. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this as I covered mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton's campaign and, and other women who have fought uh, in the public arena for acknowledgement. You know, women are judged based on the way they come across all the time. Every, every the way their voices sound, 
the way they carry themselves? Are they angry about something? And, mm -hmm. you know, Kamala Harris has a unique set of political talents that in some ways make it make her perhaps the right person to start to break these barriers. There are a lot of things that she brings to the table in terms of raw political talent. And, you know, when we talk about male politicians, we talk about this all the time. Barack Obama was a talented right. politician. So is Kamala Harris. And in some ways that, because of the way our electorate reacts to women politicians, some, it may require a different skill set, at least especially yeah. uh, this first time uh, out of the gate, if they do in fact get into the White House. And on the Hill, in that role behind the dais on the Judiciary Committee, she has managed to ask those tough questions, to be in those high-profile moments, to be sharp, to be aggressive, without coming across in a way that is necessarily off-putting in the way so many mm. people told pollsters, well, I love, I'd love to have a woman president, but maybe just mm. not that woman. So, you know, she's going to have to keep walking that line this whole time, but look, we'll see uh, how it goes starting tonight. Look, let's be honest, it's a, it's a lot about how how women politicians have been covered by uh, the collective media. And I think that change um, is help, perhaps going to help to break some of those um, old tropes or stereotypes so. that, have, that, have, that have hurt women politicians in the past. Anyway, Casey, Jen, and Donna, stick around. I'm going to sneak in another break here up ahead. We're going to go live to Philadelphia, where the former president is speaking tonight. And we're going to talk about the current president's very disturbing remarks late today. But first, on this night that belongs to the vice presidential nominee, let's go back to 2008, when then vice presidential nominee Joe Biden was making the case for Barack Obama. Choice in this election is clear. These times require more than a good soldier. They require a wise leader. A leader who can change. Change the change that everybody knows we need. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. 
how, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Welcome back to our Democratic National Convention coverage on NBC News Now. As we mentioned, President Barack Obama will be addressing the convention tonight live from the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. NBC News White House correspondent Peter Alexander is on the ground in Philadelphia, scrambled there after we found out the location. Peter, um, what have you learned? We've seen some of these excerpts, but tell us about where you are and what we expect to hear. Well, we're right here, as you noted, outside this Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, in many ways, the cradle of the American democracy. And that is by design, I'm told by those who were close to the former president, that this site was selected so that President Obama could, in effect, underscore the significance of this election, that it is our very democracy that is at stake here. And speaking to those close to the former president, they say that his responsibility tonight won't be just to go after Donald Trump, which he will do uh, effectively eviscerating him by name, saying that he's self-absorbed, that he's self-served, that he shown, has shown no interest to treat the presidency as anything more than a reality show for the attention that he craves. But it's also his responsibility, much the same way that Bill Clinton in 2012 for President Obama was sort of the explainer in chief, to be the validator in chief of Joe Biden, a person who he knows uniquely well, and the man who was the last one in the room during the giant decision making process on issues like dealing with a recession, with health care as well. And so one of the challenges for the president tonight will be to sort of put meat on that bone. But I think Chuck would all be watching for that'll be important tonight is much the same way at his convention speech uh, four years ago, we saw Donald Trump say, I alone can fix it. President Obama will say, we together have to fix it now, that it's up to all Americans to get involved in this democracy, really to make a difference right now, not just to vote, but to stay engaged. As I'm told, the message will be really for everybody, but specifically for those who are undecided and even for those who may consider not voting at all, Chuck. You know, Peter, your, your, your day job beat is the current president. Um, behind the scenes, does the Trump campaign relish a comparison with Obama or not? We know the sitting president thinks it's a good comparison. Does the campaign relish it? You know, that's a good question, Chuck. Obviously, when you speak to when you speak to the president, you pose these questions to him. It's the only the first name he brings up again, tweeting about Barack Obama tonight and Hillary Clinton saying welcome to the political battlefield. But when you talk more broadly about Barack Obama, with campaign members, they recognize that that is really their greatest challenge. They know he's the most popular politician in this country right now, which is why the president has continued to try to chip away at him, knowing that if he can sort of give the stamp approval to Joe Biden, and if that can extend beyond the masses that already support Joe Biden, that will prove problematic for President Trump. When you speak to them privately, they realize the man who will be speaking tonight, Barack Obama, is really one of their biggest challengers overall. Peter Alexander on the ground there outside where we expect to hear from President Obama. Do you have any idea, are there going to be people inside or not, Peter? If that's a good question. Actually, I'm going to reach out after this conversation, find that out. I asked before and didn't hear back, but I can tell you there are plenty of people outside. As it became news, we reported this a couple of hours ago. Hundreds of folks here in downtown Philadelphia, Philadelphia have flooded these streets just to be a part of what they believe will be a historic moment, not just Kamala Harris's speech tonight, but Barack Obama coming back to the city. Yeah, like I said, he may be at his peak of his post-presidential powers right now. Peter Alexander, thank you, sir. And as we've said multiple times this week, if it weren't for, you know, the virus, we'd be doing this show from Milwaukee because that's where the Democrats would be putting on their show. And while the Democratic National Convention is a very small footprint in Wisconsin this year, Vice President Mike Pence was there today, campaigning in the battleground state and working to boost turnout in reliably red areas of that state. Our own Garrett Haake uh, was with the vice president in southern Wisconsin today, and he filed this for us. When it's all said and down, the White House and their surrogates have been on the ground in Wisconsin nearly as much as the Democrats have, despite the Democrats putting their convention in Milwaukee. The president was here earlier in the week. Eric Trump was here yesterday. Vice President Mike Pence campaigning here today. They're trying to be everywhere in the state, and it makes sense. Of course, this is a state that the president carried by fewer than 25,000 votes. It had been reliably Democratic before that. 
And you're seeing the contours of the president's strategy here. They are trying to juice numbers in the more rural parts of the state where he is more popular, foregoing to some degree some of the more traditional suburban Republican parts of the state. So today, the vice president was here in Walworth County. This is a place where Republican presidential candidates have a 100-year winning streak. Uh, and he's trying to wring as much support as he possibly can from those dedicated Trump supporters, taking people who are definitely voters and trying to turn them into volunteers and activists. And he's also trying to keep people like Debbie Burdick, a retiree who I spoke to a little while ago, in the fold, not exactly happy with this president, but not going to go anywhere near a Democratic candidate. Here's what Debbie told me. A lot of people say it's because he's a businessman. He hasn't been a lifetime politician and he tells it like it is. But I don't like the way he tells it. You know, I don't I don't like the way he appears to ignore his wife. I don't like the way he talks about women, whether it's now or in the past. I don't like the way he does not easily show empathy for people when he should be showing his heart. And it, it makes me embarrassed that he's my choice. And a long conversation with Debbie, and she seems for all the world like the kind of Republican that the Biden campaign would love to target. She wants to see a president with empathy. She wants to see somebody who takes the virus more seriously. But she also told me she's scared to death of the Democratic Party. Whatever positive feelings she might have about Joe Biden, those don't extend to Kamala Harris. Those don't extend to congressional Democrats. And she doesn't want to see them in charge. So for the Biden campaign, perhaps the most they can hope for is to keep voters like Debbie at home. That was the one thing that Debbie said might be the case here, that, you know, as much as she probably wants the president to get reelected. She could imagine a scenario in which she does not vote. And again, in a state decided by fewer than 25,000 votes, that could make all the difference. Big thanks to Garrett Haig there. That was a fascinating, fascinating report about just one voter. We're not sure how emblematic it is, but a fascinating insight nonetheless. Well, joining me now uh, to talk a little bit more about Wisconsin's Mandela Barnes. He's the lieutenant governor of that state. Mr. Lieutenant Governor, it is Good to see you again. So I hope you got a chance to hear that voter um, just now. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. Um, how, do you how would you talk to that voter? How would you make the case? She's skeptical of Democrats, doesn't like this president. How do you make the case to her? Yeah, that's actually the second time I got to uh, hear her today. I uh, saw her earlier. And the case to be made to that sort of candidate is, you know, that there is a better way. There is a choice for the candidate in Joe Biden who actually has listen to every concern that she laid out. It doesn't have to be this way. People don't have to be put in a trance by Donald Trump, which seems to have been the case. You know, he has his faithful voters, his loyal following, those who may never leave his side. But I think that's because people haven't just taken a chance to uh, listen to what Joe Biden is actually talking about, especially in terms of improving quality of life for Americans and people like her uh, across Wisconsin. What, um, tell me about the small footprint now on this convention and, and, uh, you know, is it, do you feel as if Milwaukee's engaged? Because obviously one of the reasons was to engage um, Milwaukee residents in particular, getting them more interested in this election, obviously much harder in, in a virtual format. Um, what kind of luck have you had, do you feel like, engaging um, Milwaukee and Madison? Yeah, I do feel like Milwaukee is engaged, certainly not to the degree that, to the degree that we expected it to be engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't prevent, I mean, well, with the pandemic, yeah, there's very little that we can do. Unfortunately, we have a president who pretended that it did not exist. And now we're in the situation that we are in the United States of America, having uh, this number of people infected. So it's not safe to do it. And I can just talk about, uh, for one second, with Mike Pence and his visit, I've categorized those visits as being very reckless. Uh, but the thing is, it shows that they're willing to die uh, to save their own selves and their uh, and their hopes for re-election. And not only are they willing to die for re-election, they're willing to put other people's lives at risk. Herman Cain was already a casualty of the Trump re-election. You know that I, you know this this divide on how to campaign, right? The, there's no doubt the Trump campaign has decided to double down on in-person campaigning, trying to do in-person door knocking. You, you guys are all putting health first here. Uh, how concerned are you that you're not going to be able to do the face-to-face, -face, get, get out the vote type of, of organizing that clearly was helpful in 2018 in, in the state of Wisconsin? Well, yeah, 
I'll, I'll be honest, it's definitely a concern because the more face-to-face -face conversations we're able to have, uh, the more we're able to introduce ourselves to voters, the more we're able to get out in front and not let them or not let Republicans uh, define who Democrats are, which has been a problem of ours uh, election cycle after election cycle. Uh, but I don't foresee that much door knocking happening uh, from Republicans either, because people aren't going to be as willing to answer the door for a stranger as they have been in years past. So it's going to be important for us to engage in not just digital, but also traditional media, uh, because when you knock at a person's door, you still run the risk of a person not being home at all or a person right. not wanting to have a conversation. And while people are at home, they are consuming media. Their televisions are on. They are reading newspapers, be it actual print newspapers or reading the news online. So there's still a, an incredible chance for us to get in front of people. Uh, I am concerned about not having those face-to-face -face conversations as much as I'm concerned about not being able to have those large-scale rallies that get us so pumped up and energized. Right. Uh, but it's not a happy time in America right now. People are excited to, to, to go out and get engaged in those sort of events. And you look at all the polling data, most Americans yeah. take this very seriously. Uh, so yeah. I think we are doing the right thing, and the voting uh, public will respond quite well to it. Mandela Barnes, the lieutenant governor uh, from Wisconsin. Appreciate you coming on. Um, and uh, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the convention as best you can under these circumstances. Okay. Appreciate it. We want to update you on something the president said earlier tonight about QAnon. QAnon is a group of conspiracy theorists whose views have quickly spread from the fringes of the Internet to parts of mainstream America. And QAnon has inspired some violent acts. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Hallie Jackson joins me now. And Hallie, look, this is a preview of the Democratic National Convention. We didn't plan on, on having a big uh, Donald Trump segment in here. But what he said yeah. today was alarming. What did he say? Tell us about it. So, and let me just, I'm sure, Chuck, that you didn't plan to be uttering the words satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals in relation to your DNC coverage here tonight. But that is where we find ourselves here, because that is the, the very fringe, just bananas conspiracy theory that QAnon is, essentially, the belief that President Trump has been tasked uh, by this cabal to basically bring these this, this satanic ring to justice, if you will. Uh, and it is, you, you talk about the violent acts. It is a huge issue to the point where last year the FBI even designated it essentially domestic terror, concerned about the threat of extremism and violence from QAnon supporters. So President Trump was asked about this. Why? Because recently there have been a couple of people, specifically Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has who had success politically. The president has backed her. She openly talks about uh, QAnon conspiracy theories and has, has expressed and shown support for that. The president dodged a question about this a couple of days ago. But some reporters in the White House briefing room, including one of our colleagues, Shannon Pettypiece, wanted to know more. And I want to play you that exchange. Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much, uh, which I appreciate. But I don't know much about the movement. I've heard these are people that love our country. But the crux of the theory is this belief that you are secretly saving the world from this satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals. Does that sound like something you are behind? Or well, I haven't, I haven't heard that, but... Uh, is that supposed to be a bad thing or a good thing? I mean, you know, if, uh, if I can help save the world from problems, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to put myself out there. And we are, actually. So here is why that is such an extraordinary answer, Chuck, because the president uh, not only did not disavow QAnon, right, but said, I appreciate the support, even in the same breath. And we should note, he said, I don't know much about them. I don't know much about the theory. Y you have to remember, this is not new, right? If this was in maybe 2018, 2019, a, a lot of people didn't know Q. Some people may not know Q now still, which, you know, it's been in the news quite a bit, especially over these past few days. President Trump follows the news. You have to imagine somebody would have or perhaps should have and the administration briefed him about this, and yet that is the answer he gives. Why? Uh, you know Brennan Buck, a political strategist here in Washington who used to work for Paul Ryan and others, and he made what I think is a, a valid point or an interesting point. The President Trump often finds it difficult to default to anything other than if they support Donald Trump, they must not be too bad. 
Uh, and that has been a pattern time and again. And it appears that that is sort of what the direction the president was headed as he got these series of right. questions in the briefing today. Now, there's also, listen, there is the risk, right? There are people who say, even just talking about QAnon and this, I know, again, crazy conspiracy theory gives oxygen to it. And so there is, you know, I think some soul searching the media, but you have to remember, this is something that the president is himself needing to address because again, there are people who are right. wanting to get into the mainstream sort of Republican uh, right. bloodstream here uh, who believe this stuff. Well, it's even worse. The belief is somehow puts him at the center. He just embraced it again. We look, he told us he would do this right at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, four years ago when he refused to, to denounce David Duke. Um, and in some ways, here we go again. Uh, Hallie Jackson uh, with that important report for us. Hallie, thank you. Still with us, Casey Hunt, Jennifer Palmieri, and Donna Edwards. Uh, and guys, I'm not going to keep going down that rabbit hole. I want to turn a little bit to tonight. Um, there are a slew of other um, uh, a-list Democratic stars speaking tonight that are not named Kamala Harris and Barack Obama. You've got Elizabeth Warren. You've got Nancy Pelosi. you got Hillary Clinton. Jennifer Palmieri, Hillary Clinton's not speaking in the 10 o'clock hour, but Elizabeth Warren and Nancy Pelosi are. Um, what should we take away from that? Do you think she cares, Chuck? I don't think she cares. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I mean, she's happy to do, she's, you know, she is happy to do whatever is useful to the ticket. And I, I do wish, I mean, there's, I have a couple of thoughts about the women that are speaking tonight. One is it's, uh, there's a remarkable number of them. And what I love about it is it's totally organic. The Democrats didn't have to go looking to fill the slots with women. Right. They are the leaders of our party, the former, the speaker of the house, the former, the, you know, a major presidential candidate and the former, um, nominee. And I know right. that I do wish that Hillary got to walk into the, um, arena in Milwaukee tonight. Cause I know that there would have been a real outpouring of love for her, but I, you know, she, you saw the excerpts from her mark, mark woulda, coulda, shoulda, do not let that happen. And she's the personification of, you know, uh, she's the walking personification of that. Right. And that's, I think, her message is. Casey Hunt, uh, Na Nancy Pelosi uh, is going to be speaking, and I think she's the leadoff speaker in the in the second hour. She's also knee deep in post office and, and coronavirus relief. What do we expect from her? Well, Chuck, she has been perhaps the highest profile over the last couple of years, Democrat in Washington who has taken on President Trump. And, you know, there were people who raised questions about whether she was going to be the Speaker of the House coming in after Democrats won back, won back the House in 2018. Was she, was she the right person? Were they looking for somebody new? And she not only squashed that line of thinking, got herself reinstalled as the Speaker mm -hmm. of the House, she then proceeded to become incredibly popular and take on the president in all of these ways that she's clearly learned how to get under his skin and what to say uh, to make him react in in the most in the way that that gets her what she wants quite frankly i mean they haven't spoken in months mm. so yes she is leading this battle she's bringing the house back on saturday uh, to vote on post office funding as we've seen the president transparently say that he you know if the post office doesn't get their money they can't execute uh, the election the way that they are supposed to. So I would expect to see more of that uh, from mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this is a kind of stage that she's utterly comfortable on. You know, Don Edwards, I, I feel like Nancy Pelosi is, has entered a, a new phase of, of, of sort of where, she, not just where she stands in history, but sort of how the Democratic Party embraces her. It reminds me a little bit of Ted Kennedy. You know, in the 80s and even the early 90s, there was this hesitance the whole party didn't always embrace. He had, you know, behind the scenes, they loved him, but there was always this hesitance publicly. And then at some point they realized, man, he's so talented, you know, yes, the, you know, and it was a re-embrace of him. I'm sensing that with Nancy Pelosi now in the party. Fair? Well, absolutely. And I mean, Chuck, since January 2017, it has been Nancy Pelosi who has taken on Donald Trump most directly and most effectively. And I think the party realizes that and the country realizes that. I mean, she has really come into her own in this phase of her um, her stint as, as speaker. And I think, uh, you know, I can't think of anybody not anyone who would have been able to lead Democrats in the House of Representatives and, frankly, in the Congress 
um, through this uh, other than Nancy Pelosi. And so it's actually exciting to see her uh, right. take center stage. But we also okay. have, you know, at least three Democratic women who have yep. stood in Donald Trump's head uh, for the last four <laughs> years, and it's going to make him Run crazy. Free. Exactly. Living there rent free, as the, as the expression goes. Casey, Jen and Donna, uh, an excellent way to uh, pregame the convention with uh, your, you three. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us this hour. The program for night three of the Democratic National Convention will begin in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. And if there's a problem, we'll come right back. Here it is. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, everybody, it's me, Kamala. So before I go on stage later tonight, I want to talk about the importance of voting. I know many of you plan to vote this year, but amidst the excitement and enthusiasm for this election, you've also heard about obstacles and misinformation and folks making it harder for you to cast your ballot. So I think we need to ask ourselves, why don't they want us to vote? Why is there so much effort to silence our voices? And the answer is because when we vote, things change. When we vote, things get better. When we vote, we address the need for all people to be treated with dignity and respect in our country. So each of us needs a plan, a voting plan. Joe and I want to make sure you're prepared. If you text VOTE to 30330, we'll help you come up with your plan and remember deadlines and get ready to vote in your community. So send that text and encourage your family and friends to send one, too. Now let's enjoy another night of inspiration from around our country. I'll see you a little later tonight. And until then, I turn it over to my dear friend and tonight's moderator, Carrie Washington. Welcome to night three of the Democratic National Convention. I am honored to be joining you as we continue to celebrate this unconventional convention. We're going to be hearing a lot more from Senator Harris later, I promise. But first, when I was in seventh or eighth grade, we memorized the preamble of the Constitution, and I've never forgotten it. The first 15 words of our Constitution are, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. We say more perfect because our union is not without flaws. When our Constitution was written, women couldn't vote. Black people were considered three-fifths of a human being, but therein lies the work. No one is perfect. Nothing is, but it is the striving toward justice, equality, and truth that distinguishes us. We fight for a more perfect union because we are fighting for the soul of this country and for our lives. And right now, that fight is real. Tonight, we are going to hear from so many phenomenal women who are working to help us build that more perfect union. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Secretary Hillary Clinton, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. We're going to see an incredible performance from Jennifer Hudson and a world premiere performance from Billie Eilish. We'll meet so many of the activists and organizers working to build a more equal, more just future. And we're going to hear from our 44th president, Barack Obama. <laughs> That's a long way of saying this is going to be an unforgettable night filled with important voices. But the most important voice we hope to hear from tonight is the one we need to hear from most. It's yours. Because if we are going to repair the damage that has been done, if we are going to finally realize the dream, we, the people, have to get involved. Each and every one of us is the we. You 
are the we. It's going to be your voice, your service, your action that helps us create that more perfect union. Tonight, we're gonna talk about where we are and where we're going on so many issues important to our future. 90% of Americans support common sense gun laws because we need to do more to address the epidemic of gun violence. Let's start there. People affected by everyday gun violence have to walk by the street corner where their best friend, their brother, their mother, their nephew, where they themselves were shot. And life goes on and on as if we all haven't just watched a loved one die and get put in the grave. The whole point of what I'm saying here is until one of us or all of us stand up and say, I can't do this anymore. I can't sit by and watch the news treat these shootings like acts of God. Gun violence isn't just going to stop until there's a force fighting harder against it, and I'm going to do something to prevent it. They say that tougher gun laws do not decrease gun violence. We call BS! They say a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. We call BS! been able to prevent the hundreds of senseless tragedies that have occurred. We call BS! That us kids don't know what we're talking about, that we're too young to understand how the government works. We call BS! What we're fighting for will happen, because we're fighting so strongly for it. We're going to make this change. Long before this pandemic, our country has been suffering from the epidemic of gun violence. Gun violence is a public health crisis, one that disproportionately affects the black and brown communities. First, it was my beloved fiance. My son, Jerry, at the Pulse shooting in Orlando. Seven years later, it would be my son. I know exactly the pain, the toll, the heartbreak of gun violence. My freshman year, my high school went into lockdown because a kid brought a gun to school. We've had to endure live shooter training drills in our schools. High schoolers have enough to deal with. They shouldn't also be responsible for keeping themselves safe at school. That's the job of the government. We have to end corporate lobbying by the NRA. We have to invest in mental health in our communities rather than making our schools maximum security prisons. I want a president who will make gun violence prevention a top priority, and I believe Joe Biden is that person. And now, mother and activist, Deandra Dykus. In a split second, a stray bullet shattered my family's life. My son, Deandre, was only 13 years old. He was recognized as a gifted and talented student. His possibilities were endless. He was dancing at a birthday party when he was shot in the back left side of his head, shattering his skull. One shot changed our lives forever. Today, my Dre does not talk. He does not walk. I know he knows me by the smile he shows when I walk in his room, but I'm unsure if he knows a gunshot has changed his life. Since March, I've only been able to see my son three times, but I can't touch or hug him due to COVID-19. People tell me that I'm lucky. I tell them we are blessed. I remind them that my son is in a wheelchair and unable to feed himself. I don't think DeAndre feels lucky when he has to be bathed from head to toe or gets injections for muscle contractions. I am in a space of gratitude. Yes, I can touch DeAndre. I can hold his hand. But the child that I birthed is not able to live his dreams. And that hurts. Every day, we're reminded that he may never be the same. We are not alone. 
In every town across America, there are families who know what a bullet can do. That's why I'm a mom who volunteers to stop this. President Trump, he doesn't care. He didn't care about the victims after Parkland, Las Vegas, or El Paso. I want a president who cares about our pain and grief. A president who will take on the gun lobby to ban assault weapons and close the loopholes to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. Joe Biden has taken on the NRA twice and won, and he will do it again as president. I've looked in the eyes of too many parents, and I mean literally scores of them, who've lost their children to gun violence. I've looked in the eyes of brave young people who survived school shootings. And I made each of them a promise. I made myself a promise. I promise them, and I promise all of you, I will make this promise today, those families hurting across the country. I will never, 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 never give up this fight. Out of pain, we choose to find meaning. A glimmer of light that lands on a promise. Former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, shot in the head from less than three feet away. But she survived. When tragedy strikes, we seek comfort in knowing we aren't alone. Join us in this fight. We seek strength to keep fighting, to keep moving forward. We turn to leaders who share our pain. In the most difficult times, it's when we stand closest together. It's out of tragedy that we grow stronger. He was there for me. He'll be there for you, too. We are a nation ready to end gun violence. A safer America is possible. But from this point forward, we must choose courage. I've known the darkest of days, days of pain and uncertain recovery. But confronted by despair, I've summoned hope. Confronted by paralysis and aphasia, I responded with grit and determination. I put one foot in front of the other. I found one word and then I found another. My recovery is a daily fight, but fighting makes me stronger. Words once came easily, today I struggle to speak. But I have not lost my voice. America needs all of us to speak out, even when you have to fight to find the words. We are at a crossroads. We can let the shooting continue, or we can act. We can protect our families, our future. We can vote. We can be on the right side of history. We must elect Joe Biden. He was there for me. He'll be there for you, too. Join us in this fight. Vote, vote, vote. Thank you very much. Tonight, we're going to hear from many changemakers who are using their powers for good, who are working to confront the other epidemics we're facing, COVID-19, structural racism, police violence against black bodies, violence against members of the trans community. We are facing so many challenges. To meet these challenges, we will need systematic solutions. We need leaders who can see us, hear us, represent us, all of us. To Joe Biden, nothing is more important than taking the time to make sure that people are seen, heard, and believed in. I was interning in D.C., and I remember I called my grandmother, and I said, Joe Biden's walking by, and she goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, put him on. <laughs> and I see his staffer going, like, no, 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 like, don't don't take the call. What are you doing? And he, he, he points to his staffer, and he goes, like, like, go that way, and he sent his staffer away. How could I not be endeared to him instantly? 
he talked to me for the next half hour. I see Dana Bash from CNN there. And she, she says, like, Senator Biden will be on in like five. And he sends her away. He asked me about my sons. He asked me about what I did. All I know is it was all about me, not about him. And then he comes back to me then and he goes, it was lovely talking to your grandmother. And then he starts the interview with Dana Bash. It was, it was unbelievable. I must interject one thing. At the very end of his chat with me, he said, could you do me a favor? I said, sure, what is it? He said, tell me how I can get your grandson's hair. <laughs> he was good humor, he was sensitive, and here it is all these years later, and it's vivid in my mind. You know, as much as I feel like I got to know him in that moment, it feels like he knows us. I know Joe because he listens. And whether he's heard your story or someone else's story, he cares about everyone's story. He'll care more about you than he'll care about himself. What a beautiful story. Okay, now let's talk about another important issue, the climate crisis. This is an issue that has been on Joe Biden's mind for decades. In 1986, while working as a senator, Joe Biden introduced one of the first climate bills in Congress, and he's continued to listen to and work with climate advocates and activists, putting forward a plan to address climate change and create a clean energy economy. There are battles that we need to fight and we need to win to secure our future in this country. But there's one issue that is an existential threat to all of us, and that is climate change. The climate crisis is here, and we must act. It is the most pressing issue of our time, and it deserves to be treated as such. We no longer have any time to wait. Our generation will bear the burden of past mistakes, but we stand to benefit most from changing course now. We know that in a couple of years, it will be too late. We need to change the paradigm and that happens here with us. We should invest massively in wind, solar, geothermal, green infrastructure. Moving away from fossil fuels and being highly competitive in renewables. We need to lay out our specific policies so that we can give our children, my children, your children, a planet that can sustain them. That needs to happen now. We need it now. The moment demands it. We can afford nothing less. Good evening, America. I'm Michelle Lujan Grisham, governor of the great state of Nuevo Mexico. I'm proud of my home state every single day, especially how we have punched above our weight in our successful response to COVID-19. I'm proud of New Mexicans from Taos to Truth or Consequences who have stepped up and sacrificed in so many incredible ways this past half year. And I'm proud how we embrace our multicultural identity as our greatest strength. And I'm proud that New Mexico has shown what climate leadership looks like. While the Trump administration has been eliminating environmental protections, we've expanded them. While they've been rolling back regulations on oil and gas, we've taken on polluters and held them accountable. We've committed to a renewable energy future with exciting and fulfilling careers for workers all across our beautiful strait, including right here in the heart of northern New Mexico. We're laying a roadmap here for what America can and should look like in the 21st century. An America where we lead again, where we build safer, cleaner, and more affordable cities and communities, where we provide meaningful opportunities for workers and families to thrive and build better lives. As president, Joe Biden will rejoin the International Climate Agreement, and the United States will once again lead on this critical issue. At home, he'll invest in energy workers, and he will deliver for working families across the U.S., helping them build meaningful careers while accelerating our nation and world into a clean, green 21st century and well beyond. 
We know time is running out to save our planet. We have the chance this November to end two existential crises, the Trump presidency and the environmental annihilation he represents. We have the chance this November to attack the climate crisis, invest in green 21st century jobs, and embrace the clean energy revolution our country, our young people are crying out for, and the leadership the rest of the world is waiting for. The choice is clear. The choice is Joe Biden. Thank you, America. Hard work, rising to a challenge, the American way. Going to the moon was all three. The eagle has landed. Many astronauts returned home and reported a shift in their awareness. The view they saw of Earth from space was profound. The world looked beautiful, tiny, fragile. Our atmosphere is all that separates us from oblivion. We now call what they experienced the overview effect. Here in Detroit, our communities for such a long time have faced the burden of pollution. And I think addressing climate change gives us an opportunity to correct some of those wrongs and to also invest in our vulnerable communities. Maybe you've read some of the millions of pages of scientific evidence on climate change. Rushing storm, sir. Or maybe you felt it as you walked the neighborhood. Oh my God, the truck is sinking. For most people, it's overwhelming. All of this with the global warming and the, that, a lot of it's a hoax, it's a hoax. I had spent five years working on this report. The Trump administration started to remove any mention that humans were the cause of climate change from it. I wrote my resignation letter just six months into the administration. They were handing the keys of public lands over to private interests. The Trump administration has gone all out, not just to neglect climate change issues and laws, but to reverse them. We have about a decade before it's too late. I'm a kid, and I'm gonna say to all those adults who are watching this right now, why don't you get up and do something? Some of the first climate change legislation ever written was by a senator from Delaware. When Donald Trump thinks about climate change, the only word he can muster is hoax. America faces a challenge, but if we face it together, we will rise to the occasion and build back better. When I think about climate change, the word I think of is jobs. That's Joe's plan, create millions of new good paying jobs, many of them union, like mine. Invest in critical infrastructure, upgrade millions of buildings, invest in micro mobility and precision agriculture, a clean energy future that achieves net zero emissions by 2050, because we can't power the economies of the future without investing in the technologies of the future. I think what's really important about Joe Biden's plan is that 40% of the investment will go to vulnerable communities. We know how to do this. We'll do it again, but this time bigger and faster and smarter. Joe won't ignore the crisis. We're seeing what happens when we do that. He won't surrender to the fight. Joe's America will lead the world on clean energy. We'll lead on job creation and America will lead the world again on climate. I was 13 when the campfire, the most destructive wildfire in California's history broke out. We were visiting family nearly 100 miles away, but my asthma flared badly. I could hardly breathe. I'm Alexandra V. Senor, and I've been organizing young people around climate change since 2018. Climate change is impacting us now, and it's robbing my generation of a future. For young people my age, every aspect of our lives, from where we go to school, to what kind of careers we'll have, to whether or not we can raise a family, depends on us taking climate change seriously right now. Joe Biden won't solve this crisis in four years. No one can. But he will put us back on track so that my generation can have a fighting chance. I'm asking you to join us. Don't let our futures go up in flames. The corn growers near my parents' farm have a saying, knee high by the 4th of July. These days they're lucky if the corn is even planted because of unpredictable and torrential spring rains. I'm Andrew Adamski. I studied microbial ecology at Northern Michigan University. 
Us farmers can see the effects of climate change happening right in front of us. So we've been trying to do our part. We're adopting sustainable solutions on my family's farm, switching to a community model, using less land and reusing our resources to grow our food. We are eliminating tons of carbon pollution every year by mimicking natural ecosystems. Farmers can be part of the climate solution instead of a problem. Today, we all can grow our own future, but we need our leaders to be part of the solution as well, instead of part of the problem. We need them to commit to the science, not ignore it. We need them to put real plans on the table rather than roll them back. That's what Joe Biden is doing with his clean energy revolution. Instead of being left behind, we could lead the world again. I spend a lot of time talking about climate change with different communities here in Nevada. And the one question that I get asked over and over again is, what are you doing here? Not a lot of climate activists look like me. My name is Katerin Lorenzo. I'm an Afro-Latina and I'm a climate activist. I grew up in a low income neighborhood where pollution rates are often higher than wealthier areas and a lot of kids have asthma. Switching to renewable energy would mean cleaner air, better health and a steadier income for folks in neighborhoods like mine because solar PV installers and wind turbine techs are some of the fastest growing jobs in the country. And Joe Biden's plan is transformative. He knows that saving the planet isn't just a challenge to overcome, it's an opportunity for a better way of life. So what's it gonna be, America? Are you ready to vote for Joe Biden? Are you ready to solve the climate crisis? Because our futures depend on it. Like the folks we just heard from, next up is another activist and environmentalist, not to mention an immensely talented artist. She worked to ensure that her most recent concert tour was green and sustainable, urging her fans to take similar actions in their daily lives. And even before she herself was old enough to vote, she held registration drives before her shows, signing up thousands of voters. She's a voice for her generation in both her music and her activism. Here to perform My Future publicly for the first time, Billie Eilish. You don't need me to tell you things are a mess. Donald Trump is destroying our country and everything we care about. We need leaders who will solve problems like climate change and COVID, not deny them leaders who will fight against systemic racism and inequality. And that starts by voting for someone who understands how much is at stake, someone who's building a team that shares our values. It starts with voting against Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. Silence is not an option and we cannot sit this one out. We all have to vote like our lives and the world depend on it because they do. The only way to be certain of the future is to make it ourselves. Please register, please vote. I can't seem to focus on you
Billie Eilish, thank you. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna talk about something close to my heart. The black community in this country is hugely diverse. On my father's side, I am descended from African Americans who came from slave ships that landed in South Carolina and who were part of the great migration north that has played such a defining role in who we are as a nation. On my mother's side, my grandparents came here as immigrants, part of a rich history that has also defined America. They immigrated to this country from the West Indies through Ellis Island in the 1920s. I often think about how my grandmother must have felt when she first saw the Statue of Liberty in her raised torch. My family's story is not unique. Unless you're Native American, your family likely came here from somewhere else. Whether it was five years ago or 200 years ago, whether it was by choice or by bondage, etched into the DNA of who we are as a nation is the very idea that though you may be from somewhere else, you can find your home here. But that idea is in danger now more than ever before. Amazing. Tell me when I start reading. Dear Donald Trump, my name is Estella. I am 11 years old. My mom is my best friend. She came to America as a teenager over 20 years ago without papers in search of a better life. She married my dad who served our country as a Marine in South America, Africa, and Iraq. My mom worked hard and paid taxes and the Obama administration told her she could stay. My dad thought you would protect military families, so he voted for you in 2016, Mr. President. He says he won't vote for you again after what you did to our family. The wife of a U.S. Marine veteran was deported to Mexico. Instead of protecting us, you tore our world apart. My mom is a good person, and she's not a criminal. Now, my mom is gone, and she's been taken from us for no reason at all. Every day that passes, you deport more moms and dads and take them away from kids like me. We will begin moving them out day one separated thousands of children from their parents and you put them in cages. Some of those kids are now orphans because of you. These are our people. I don't want them in our country. They're animals! Mr. President, my mom is the wife of a proud American Marine and a mother of two American children. We are American families. We need a president who will bring people together not tear them apart. Sincerely, Estella. I'm Lucy Sanchez, and this is my mother, Sylvia, and sister, Jessica. We're like all families. We work hard to build a good life. I was born with spina bifida. That means my spinal cord didn't form as it should. And the doctors in my town said I wouldn't survive. They gave my mother no hope for my future. I'm a US citizen, but my mother is undocumented. And I am a dreamer. Yo hice lo que cualquier madre haría para salvar la vida de su niña. My mother did what any mother would do to save her baby's life. Tomé a mi niña en brazos, viajamos a la frontera. Al llegar al río, la levanté sobre el agua y cruzamos. She took my sister in her arms and traveled for days to reach the border. And when they got to the river, she lifted my sister above the water and crossed. We came to America before I was one year old. She saved my life. No podía esperar. Tenía que venir en ese momento en busca de un milagro. My mother had no choice. There was no time to wait to save my sister. She came here looking for a miracle. Tenía miedo que nos encontraran, que nos detuvieran y nos regresaran, pero yo tenía que salvar a mi hija. We were afraid they would find us and detain us, but she had to save her daughter. Our home is here. North Carolina is all I know. I qualified for DACA, but Donald Trump took away my ability to apply for the program. Trabajamos duro, salimos adelante, pagamos impuestos. We work hard, we contribute to our community, and we pay our taxes. I've gone to school and built a good life for me and my two daughters. I want to go to law school. I want to help my community. But ever since Donald Trump was elected, all our fears have returned. We don't know if our family will be separated. Will my mom and sister be detained? 
Will my sister get the health care she needs and deserves? I don't have the right ID, so I can't get health insurance through the exchange. I need health insurance. I deserve it, right? Claro que sí, mija. Todos merecemos esperanza, buena vida y salud. Me rompe el corazón ver cómo separan a niños de sus familias en la frontera. Eso está mal. Esos bebés necesitan a sus padres. It breaks our hearts to see children separated from their families at the border. That's wrong. Those children need their parents. On November 3rd, I'm going to vote for my mother, my sister, and my daughters. I will vote for a future where all of our lives have dignity and respect. We need a leader who will fix the broken immigration system and commit to keeping families together. I'm voting for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the daughter of immigrants. Who are you going to vote for? Estamos todos juntos. Envía la palabra Únete al 30330. There's something unique about America. We don't simply welcome new immigrants. We are born of immigrants. That is who we are. Immigration is our origin story. After all, unless your family is Native American, all of our families come from someplace else. In these new Americans, we see our own American stories. Life in America was not always easy. There was discrimination and hardship and poverty. But like you, they no doubt found inspiration in all those who had come before them. And they were able to muster faith that here in America, they might build a better life and give their children something more. throughout our history between welcoming or rejecting the stranger it's about more than just immigration it's about the meaning of America what kind of country do we want to be immigrants are the teachers who inspire our children they're the doctors who keep us healthy they're the engineers who design our skylines and the artists and the entertainers who touch our hearts Immigrants are soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen who protect us. We can never say it often or loudly enough. Immigrants and refugees revitalize and renew America. It's not something to take for granted. It's something to cherish and to fight for. God bless you. God bless the United States of America.
Unite, let's stand by each other. Don't forget to vote this November. Together we can make a change. Ya lo saben. No se olviden votar este noviembre. En la unión está la fuerza. Let's go. That was Prince Royce. Amazing shout out to the Boogie Down Bronx. <laughs> In this next piece, you'll hear about the vital role that women have played in moving us toward a more perfect union and breaking through that proverbial glass ceiling. And after that, you'll hear from Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, the woman who put over 65 million cracks in it. She was called an instigator, a rule breaker, a rabble rouser. And she is called the agitator, the pushy one, the one with attitude. Now is the time for all of us to stand up and say enough is enough. We just got From the ballot box to the factory floor, from her living room to the ER, she makes trouble, the good kind. She is the mother who cries out for sensible gun laws. This is about a right and wrong thing. The daughter who believes that equal justice means justice for all. We are America. The child who knows that black lives matter. She is our warrior on the front lines, challenging authority to make the world safe. Nobody is above the law. Refusing to be told who makes decisions about her body or anyone else's. These women and men of all ages, races, and backgrounds don't come to Planned Parenthood to make a political statement. They come to get quality, affordable health care. You are disadvantaging her because of her to public office. If we want families to succeed, we start by empowering women. When I first got elected, I came to Washington, D.C. to fight for the issues that are so important in our community. We look forward, though, to making sure that this district is finally well represented. The things that we ran on going into November, we are doing that. Women don't just fight for women. They fight for families. They fight for fairness inclusion, justice. To make our nation a more perfect union, especially for those people who are the most marginal. If we're gonna jumpstart the middle class, we've got to ensure that college is affordable. Separation of families and children are detrimental to their health. Give the victims of gender bias in the workplace the tools they need to seek justice. Women are the most important political force in the United States of America. She represents her views on education. We've got to pay educators more, and we've got to hire more educators. So we're going to raise up the profile of teachers and celebrate who they are and give them better pay. She represents her concerns about health care. Health care is the number one issue in this election every day, every day. She speaks out on equal pay. It's very frustrating for women everywhere because you're feeling like they aren't getting paid what they should be. And focuses on protecting our children. Let's give parents the peace of mind that their kids are safe and are being set up for success. Caring for our seniors and the people who care for them. She keeps this nation going even in challenging times. And while running for office is not easy, What's wrong with my running for president of this country? Nevertheless, she persists. But we learned a long time ago, you don't get what you don't fight for. And perseveres. This is our time. And prevails. Although we weren't able, 
to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time. It's got about 18 million cracks in it. A record-breaking number of women ran in the midterms and won. She builds coalitions, and she knows who her allies are. From the fight for health care to authoring the Violence Against Women's Act, to building a society where fairness and equality and opportunity applies to everyone. Joe Biden knows a stronger America is one that works for women. So go ahead and celebrate, you rabble rouser, you rule breaker, you force of nature. Our country, our world needs you. Keep rising and vote. The morning after the last election, I said, we owe Donald Trump an open mind and the chance to lead. I meant it. Every president deserves that. And Trump came in with so much set up for him, a strong economy, plans for managing crises, including a pandemic. Yes, we Democrats would have disagreed with him on many things. But if he had put his own interests and ego aside, seen the humanity in a child ripped from her parents at the border, or a protester calling for justice, or a family wiped out by natural disaster, that would have been a good thing for America and the world. I wish Donald Trump knew how to be a president, because America needs a president right now. Throughout this time of crisis, Americans keep going, checking on neighbors, showing up to jobs as first responders, hospitals, grocery stores, nursing homes. Yes, it still takes a village. And we need leaders equal to this moment of sacrifice and service. We need Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Everyone has a story about Joe's caring and empathy. I remember him calling after my mother Dorothy died, and we talked about being raised by strong women. The best testament to Joe is how he's cared for his family. And how great is it that Dr. Jill Biden plans to keep teaching as First Lady? And Joe picked the right partner in Kamala. She's relentless in the pursuit of justice and equity, and she's kind. When her press secretary, Tyrone Gale, was dying of cancer, she dropped everything to be with him in his final moments. I know something about the slings and arrows she'll face, and believe me, this former district attorney and attorney general can handle them all. So this is the team to pull our nation back from the brink. But they can't do it without us. For four years, people have told me, I didn't realize how dangerous he was. I wish I could do it all over, or worse, I should have voted. Look. This can't be another woulda, coulda, shoulda election. If you vote by mail, request your ballot now and send it back right away. If you vote in person, do it early. Become a poll worker. Most of all, no matter what, vote. As Michelle Obama and Bernie Sanders warned us, if Trump is reelected, things will get even worse. That's why we need unity now more than ever. Remember back in 2016 when Trump asked, what do you have to lose? Well, now we know. Our health care, our jobs, our loved ones, our leadership in the world, and even our post office. But let's set our sights higher than getting one man out of the White House. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to give us so much to vote for. Let's vote for the jobs that Joe's plan will create clean energy jobs to fight climate change, caregiving jobs with living wages, vote for emergency relief that lifts small businesses and saves hardworking people from foreclosures and evictions. It's wrong that billionaires got $400 billion richer during the pandemic while millions lost their $600 a week in extra unemployment. Vote for the parents and teachers struggling to balance children's education and safety, and for healthcare workers fighting COVID-19 with little help from the White House. 
vote for paid family leave and health care for everyone, or Social Security, Medicare, and Planned Parenthood. Vote for dreamers and their families. Vote for law enforcement purged of racial bias that keeps all our streets safe. Vote for justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, because black lives matter. Vote for honest elections so we, not a foreign adversary, choose our president. Vote for the diverse, hopeful America we saw in last night's roll call. And don't forget, Joe and Kamala can win by three million votes and still lose. Take it from me. So we need numbers overwhelming so Trump can't sneak or steal his way to victory. Text VOTE 30330 to get started. A hundred years ago yesterday, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. It took seven decades of suffragists marching, picketing, and going to jail to push us closer to a more perfect union. 55 years ago, John Lewis marched and bled in Selma because that work was unfinished. Tonight, I'm thinking of the girls and boys who see themselves in America's future because of Kamala Harris, a black woman, the daughter of Jamaican and Indian immigrants, and our nominee for vice president. This is our country's story, breaking down barriers and expanding the circle of possibility. And to the young people watching, don't give up on America. Despite our flaws and problems, we've come so far. We can still be a more just, equal country with opportunities previous generations could never have imagined. There's a lot of heartbreak in America now. And the truth is, many things were broken before the pandemic. But as the saying goes, the world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong at the broken places. That's Joe Biden. He knows how to keep going, unify, and lead, because he's done that for his family and country. So come November, if we're strong together, we'll heal together. We'll redeem the soul and the promise of our country, led by President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Tonight is a night steeped in women who have stepped into service and advocacy and who are using their power for good. The power of women is undeniable, whether it's in the office, in the home, or in the House of Representatives. It is my honor to introduce the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. I was never raised in a way that I would be running for public office. It didn't interest me. When I graduated from college, I got married, had five children in six years. So that was my life. When the children were grown, the opportunity to run for Congress came along. She ran because another woman said, run. And she won, starting on a path that would make history, the first woman speaker of the House. For our daughters and our granddaughters, today we have broken the marble ceiling. In her, so many saw themselves. I did feel a real responsibility to other women as I stood on the shoulders of those who went before. Now, it was her turn to say, run. And run they did, winning and making her speaker once again. We didn't have a speaker who would bring a gun bill to the floor. We didn't have a speaker who would bring a dreamer's issue to the floor. We do now. And that's good for every American. But not everyone was on board. Nancy Pelosi. 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 I'm a mother of five, grandmother of nine. I'm a temper tantrum when I see one. The power of the speaker is awesome. Awesome. If you want to go into the arena, you have to be prepared to take a punch. You also have to be prepared to throw a punch for the children. Throw a punch. 
for the children. children. From running the House to Speaker of the House and taking on the White House, unapologetic, unafraid. Madam Speaker. Congratulations, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. And now, please welcome Speaker of the United States House of, of House. Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. It is my honor Nancy to bring you the Pelosi. greetings of House Democrats, the most diverse majority in history, more than 60 percent women, people of color, and LGBTQ. Our diversity is our strength. Our unity is our power. This month, as America marks the centennial of women, finally women winning the right to vote, we do so with 105 women in the House, proudly. 90 are Democrats. To win the vote, women marched and fought and never gave in. We stand on their shoulders, charged with carrying forward the unfinished work of our nation advanced by heroes from Seneca Falls to Selma to Stonewall. Four years ago, when President Obama and Vice President Biden were in the White House, they made us proud, and their leadership made our country great. In that spirit, we come together now not to decry the darkness, but to light a way forward for our country. That is the guiding purpose of House Democrats, fighting for the people. We have sent the Senate bills for lower health care costs, for bigger paychecks, for cleaner government, protecting John Lewis's voting rights, and enacting George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We have sent the Senate bills to protect our dreamers, LGBTQ equality, to prevent gun violence, and to preserve our planet for future generations, and even more. All of this is possible for America. Who is standing in the way? Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. Our nation faces the worst health and economic catastrophe in our history. More than 5 million Americans are infected by the coronavirus. Over 170,000 have died. The science-based action in the HEROES Act we enacted three months ago is essential to safeguard lives, livelihood, and the life of our democracy. And who is standing in the way? Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. Instead of crushing the virus, they're trying to crush the Affordable Care Act and its pre-existing -condi pre conditions benefit. As Speaker of the House, I've, been, I've seen firsthand Donald Trump's disrespect for facts, for working families, and for women in particular. Disrespect written into his policies toward our health and our rights, not just his conduct. But we know what he doesn't, that when women succeed, America succeeds. And so we are unleashing the power of women to take our rightful place in our national life by championing a woman's right to choose and defending Roe v. Wade, securing safe and affordable child care, preserving Social Security and passing equal pay for equal work. Who's standing in the way? Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. So here is our answer. We will remember in November when we will elect Joe Biden president whose heart is full of love for America and rid the country of Trump's heartless disregard for America's goodness. Joe Biden's faith in God gives him the courage to lead. Joe Biden's love gives him the strength to persevere. Joe Biden is the president we need right now, battle-tested, forward-looking, honest, and authentic. He has never forgotten who he is fighting for. And Kamala Harris is the vice president we need right now, committed to our Constitution, brilliant in defending it, and a witness to the women of this nation that our voices will be heard. Our mission is to fight for a future equal to the ideals of our founders, our hopes for our children, and the sacrifices of our veterans, our brave men and women in uniform, and their families. We will increase our majority in the House. We will win a Democratic majority in the Senate. We will elect Kamala Harris vice president. And we will elect Joe Biden president of the United States of America. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. The House is the people's house. And to ensure it stays that way, we need everyone to help fund our work to elect Joe Biden and Democrats up and down the ballot. 
If you are able, please go to JoeBiden.com now and chip in whatever you can to support this campaign. Last year, under Speaker Pelosi's leadership, the House reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act. Joe Biden wrote that landmark law nearly 30 years ago. Since then, he and other leaders have built on it. But for all of this work, women are still not entirely safe. So the work must continue. Joe Biden knows that, and he is committed to doing that work, to making sure that women are safe and to making sure our voices are heard. Let's listen. My name is Ruth Glenn. In 1992, my husband shot me and left me for dead. For 13 years, my son and I had been abused by him. We finally escaped, but he tracked us down. Back then, there was limited help available and no national hotline to call. Local shelters were full. I didn't even know the name for what was happening to me then, domestic violence. Now working to end domestic violence is my life's work. I'm Marisha Hargate. When I started doing research to play Detective Olivia Benson on Law & Order SVU over 20 years ago, I was shocked to find out how many people, including children, experience physical or sexual abuse. The statistics fueled my resolve, and I committed myself to the movement to end this violence. My name is Carly Dryden. In my small hometown, I didn't feel like I could speak out about my experience with sexual assault. But at the University of Puget Sound, I met an incredible force of people working to end the culture of sexual assault. I went from survivor to advocate. As the president and CEO of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I've seen Joe Biden's passionate leadership in passing the Violence Against Women Act. Now, domestic violence rates are rising due to this pandemic. We need Congress to reauthorize and enhance that law. We need leaders who believe that a woman's life is worth fighting for. Joe Biden is that kind of leader. I created the Joyful Heart Foundation to help survivors heal and to change the way our society responds to sexual violence. The vice president has worked tirelessly by our side to end the backlog of hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits. And our work will continue because testing kits not only makes our country safer, but it sends a vital message to survivors that what happened to them matters. The most important thing you can say to a survivor is, I hear you. That's why I became a leader in It's On Us. It's a program started by Vice President Biden to eliminate sexual assault on college campuses and support a new generation of advocates, including men and boys. Because if you're silent, you're complicit. And we're just getting started. I am voting for Joe Biden on behalf of all victims and survivors of domestic violence. I'm voting for Joe Biden because it's on my generation to make sure that we never go back. I'm voting for Joe Biden for my daughter, for my sons, for all of our children. First episode was a slap to the face and he broke my eardrum. Punching, kicking, choking, threatening with a knife or a gun. He had always threatened me, if I had ever called the police on him, that he would kill me. You didn't hear voices like these in the halls of the U.S. Capitol. My husband stabbed me 13 times and broke my neck while the police were on the scene. I nearly died and I am permanently paralyzed. Senator Joe Biden invited them to speak. Battered women need to be taken seriously. Proper police response can prevent what happened to me from happening to someone else. Thank you. Thank you. At the time, the police considered domestic violence something that was not a crime. In the home, it's a private matter. And so women were responsible for their own injuries. I was about to say, I know. Well, I don't know. I can only guess how, uh, 
how, uh, how painful that is. Growing up, our father said that the greatest of all sins was the abuse of power. He told us when a bully, when someone bigger or stronger takes advantage of you, that is a really grave sin. The expectation was for all four of us to be a person of character. If you see something wrong, we were then expected to stand up and do something about it. When Joe introduced the legislation, few believed it could pass. Our bill is an ambitious undertaking. It is the first attempt to address violent crimes against women. It was hard to get the votes because you had some traditionalists who just didn't believe that there should be laws about this. But Joe doesn't give up. He's tenacious. Joe persevered, and he's very good at persuasion. And they're doing nothing to help him. Nothing. He brought together law enforcement, prosecutors, advocates, and survivors. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak. In 1994, the Violence Against Women Act became law and protected millions of American women. A lot of the change in the attitudes we have about domestic violence were shaped by his leadership on this. If you see something wrong, we were then expected to stand up and do something about it. If you're just joining us, welcome. Coming up, we're going to hear from President Barack Obama and Senator Kamala Harris, who will talk about the Biden-Harris vision for the future. But in order to get to that more perfect union, we have to acknowledge where we are. Today in America, we are struggling. Unemployment has skyrocketed and families are fighting to keep their jobs. As Joe Biden says, we need to build back better. To find out how you can join that effort, please text JOIN to 30330 to get plugged into this campaign and to get more information on how to vote and how to volunteer. Joe Biden has a plan to help working families and small businesses. Our next speaker, Hilda Solis, worked alongside him as Secretary of Labor to make sure that there were good American jobs and that Americans were safe on the job. To hear more about the Biden-Harris economic plan, please welcome Hilda Solis. Hello, I'm Hilda Solis. The day Vice President Biden swore me in as Secretary of Labor was one of the proudest moments of my life. My parents realized they had achieved their American dream because the daughter of two blue collar immigrants would make history and give voice to people just like them. American workers need a fighter now more than ever. And Joe Biden is that person because he has done it before and I've seen it firsthand. He and President Obama made it easier for home care workers to organize. They extended overtime pay to more than 4 million workers. They saved the automobile industry and a whole lot of good union jobs with it. And when millions of families lost their homes, my friend from California, Senator Kamala Harris, took on the big banks and won. But because of Donald Trump's failures, we must once again rescue a sinking economy. Millions of Americans are out of work and communities of color are the hardest hit. Millions of essential workers are putting their lives at risk with little protections and millions more are just plain tired. That's why Joe Biden and Kamala Harris actually have a plan, not only to recover what we lost, but to improve upon it, to build back better. Creating 5 million good union jobs by bringing back supply chains to America, that's building back better. Creating millions of jobs by investing in clean energy, that's building back better. And making sure that working families can afford childcare, that's how we build back better. So let me borrow and slightly edit something Joe Biden said at my swearing in. When it comes to expanding the economy for all people, no one, no one is going to be a stronger voice than our next president, Joe Biden. The conversation you're about to see proves it. 
Behind every business, there's a story. Small businesses around the country are bearing the economic brunt of the coronavirus pandemic. And behind every business, there's a family. A lot of people clearly are in pain right now. For every farm, there's a fight to stay whole. There's hard work and there's heartbreak. We are going to lose 20 to 30 percent of our small businesses. This is the story of Kevin and Molly Johnson, a family-owned business in Lake County, Ohio. We have 10 to 12 employees on a given day. When COVID-19 hit, it was a lot of confusion. I remember being scared and being uncertain. We shut down last week because we've, we ran out of work and we had enough to come in for another week. If we don't get additional orders in, we're gonna have to look at another shutdown. You can't make a big purchase equipment. You can't plan for the we future. We don't even know if we can cover payroll. When this isn't going well, it's, it's scary. You're kind of forgotten, right? The president always bragging about the stock market sort of leaves, leaves a lot of small manufacturing companies behind. We could use a little help right now, and it just seems like we get one step forward and then two steps back. This is the story of Jernay Green, who just started a clothing store and then COVID hit. Fashion has been a, a love of mine for, oh, since I was a kid. I worked really hard to save money to open this store. Did my ribbon cutting December 14th of 2019, and you know, it was booming, and then bam, here's COVID. It was scary. No one was buying anything. My employees, they're gone. I reached out to my bank, but they stated that they had no more money. It's gone to a lot of the bigger businesses, the million dollar businesses who get the bailout. And a small business like myself is just left to struggle. Being an African-American female business owner under President Trump, I feel, how can I say? I'm alone. <laughs> I'm alone. This is the story of Lin Ta and her two restaurants. One closed and one still open. It's always really hard for restaurants to begin. It would be crowded in here with babies and families and crowds outside waiting to get in. It, it was pretty exciting. And on the day of the shutdown, we were actually reviewed in the Los Angeles Times. On that day, the virus was announced as a global pandemic. It's really, really sad to see. And if we don't turn this around soon, I mean, we're gonna see this not just be this year, but you're gonna see ghost town for Main Street USA. The first decision that I had to make because 100 people are looking at you. And unfortunately, the call was to furlough everybody. At this point, I don't even see myself in business next month. The effect of this pandemic has been in his work and his spirit. It's more difficult. Mucho más trabajo. Yo voy a hacer todo lo posible por salvar el restaurante. We don't ask for much from government, but catch us when we're falling. And I know that it must feel like you're falling right now without a net. Restaurants are among the hardest businesses to succeed at, but I was going to do it in a way that was going to provide a successful career for not only myself, but 100 employees. This is the story of Dan Reiner. He's a fifth generation farmer struggling to keep his business alive. I'm not so sure that the president understands that when he thinks about business, I don't think he thinks about farmers no. as a business. No, he has no clue about this stuff. Dan, tell me a little bit about the farm. We've been here since 1864. Trade tariffs with China have just been horrible. Part of the language in the trade deal said that China does not have to buy unless the price is to their advantage. What kind of trade deal is that? That's no deal. Then when COVID hit, then everything just plummeted. Getting through now, that's the problem. That's the day-to-day -day battle. I believe that Joe Biden will be a clear voice for us, something that we have not had. Joe Biden has an understanding of what the average American is experiencing. I think he's with me. Enough is enough. It's time to help small businesses, middle class folks manage their way through a pandemic. I have a lot of confidence in Joe Biden. He's a fighter and he's the real deal. We've taken a lot of knockdowns and we know that at the end of the day, we will endure. We will rise again. Every time I get knocked down, I gotta get up and keep running, keep going, keep going.
Tonight, we've heard from the people who make America work, people who put their lives on the line to keep our country going. And since COVID-19 hit, they've taken one gut punch after another. And what has the COVID fallout done to our babies? Well, I'm here at the Early Childhood Education Center in Springfield, Massachusetts, which has been closed for months. Childcare was already hard to find before the pandemic, and now parents are stuck. No idea when schools can safely reopen and even fewer childcare options. The devastation is enormous. And the way I see it, big problems demand big solutions. Now, I love a good plan, and Joe Biden has some really good plans. Plans to bring back union jobs in manufacturing and create new union jobs in clean energy. Plans to increase Social Security benefits, cancel billions in student loan debt, and make our bankruptcy laws work for families instead of the creditors who cheat them. These plans reflect a central truth. Our economic system has been rigged to give bailouts to billionaires and kick dirt in the face of everyone else. But we can build a thriving economy by investing in families and fixing what's broken. Joe's plan to build back better includes making the wealthy pay their fair share, holding corporations accountable, repairing racial inequities, and fighting corruption in Washington. Let me tell you about one of Joe's plans that's especially close to my heart, child care. As a little girl growing up in Oklahoma, what I wanted most in the world was to be a teacher. I loved teaching. And when I had babies and was juggling my first big teaching job down in Texas, it was hard. But I could do hard. The thing that almost sank me, childcare. One night, my Aunt B called just to check in, and I thought I was fine. But then I just broke down and started to cry. I had tried holding it all together, but without reliable childcare, working was nearly impossible. And when I told Aunt B I was going to quit my job, I thought my heart would break. And then she said the words that changed my life. I can't get there tomorrow, but I'll come on Thursday. And she arrived with seven suitcases and a Pekingese named Buddy and stayed for 16 years. I get to be here tonight because of my Aunt B. I learned a fundamental truth. Nobody makes it on their own. And yet, here we are, two generations of working parents later. And if you have a baby and don't have an Aunt B, you're on your own. And here's why that is wrong. We build infrastructure like roads and bridges and communication systems so that people can work. That infrastructure helps us all because it keeps our economy going. It's time to recognize that childcare is part of the basic infrastructure of this nation. It's infrastructure for families. Joe and Kamala will make high-quality child care affordable for every family, make preschool universal, and raise the wages of every child care worker. Now, that's just one plan, but it gives you an idea of how we get this country working for everyone. Donald Trump's ignorance and incompetence have always been a danger to our country. COVID-19 was Trump's biggest test. He failed miserably. Today, America has the most COVID deaths in the world and an economic collapse. And both crises are falling hardest on black and brown families. Millions out of work, millions more trapped in cycles of poverty, millions on the brink of losing their homes, millions of restaurants and stores hanging by a thread. This crisis is bad, and it didn't have to be this way. This crisis is on Donald Trump and the Republicans who enable him. On November 3rd, we will hold them all accountable. So, whether you're planning to vote, wearing a mask, or vote by mail, please take out your phone right now and text VOTE to 30330. We all need to be in the fight to get Joe and Kamala elected. And after November, we all need to stay in the fight to get big things done. We stay in this fight 
so that when our children and our grandchildren ask what we did during this dark chapter in our nation's history, we will be able to look them squarely in the eye and say, we organized, we persisted, and we changed America. Senator Elizabeth Warren speaking tonight from Springfield, Massachusetts. Let's bring in senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule now in to talk about just what we've heard from Senator Warren. Uh, this, she leads an important constituency. Uh, Stephanie. Without a doubt, Lester, every year we know that people vote with their wallets in any election. But right now, Senator Warren just laid it out for you. The enormous changes we have seen to our economy since COVID hit have only deepened the economic divide. She laid it out. We have 30 million Americans that are currently unemployed, 30,000 and counting small businesses that have shut for good. While at the very same time, the S&P 500, the stock market, is hitting record highs. So just think about this. President Trump regularly argues that the stock market is a reflection of the overall economy. We know that's not the case. However, whether or not Joe Biden can convince the American people that his plan to build back better, right, stronger, smarter, more inclusive, can he convince America that he can build it back better? That remains to be seen. Even with everything Senator Warren laid out, President Trump continues to poll better on economic issues. All right. Stephanie, thanks. Well, uh, Joe Biden, of course, watching tonight's events play out from his home base in Wilmington, Delaware. That's where NBC's White House correspondent Kristen Welker is. Uh, for us, this tonight, we've really seen a difference, Kristen. I mean, in the first couple of nights, we saw some Republican voices. There seemed to be more of an effort to reach out to perhaps independent voters. But tonight's programming seems far more geared to the base of the party, the left of the party, um, it, whether it's Elizabeth Warren or Hillary Clinton or uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi. And, of course, Barack Obama coming up. It's a really important point, Savannah. We are hearing from so many people in this party who have made history. Of course, Barack Obama, as you mentioned, the nation's first African-American president who's going to be speaking from Philadelphia, the birthplace of the nation's democracy. And, of course, the symbolism lost on no one. He is going to argue that it is our very democracy that is at stake with this election as he makes a very personal case for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and as he delivers his most searing indictment yet of President Trump. And then we are going to hear from Senator Kamala Harris. She will deliver what is arguably the most important speech of her career as she has a history-making night, as she becomes the first woman of color to receive her party's nomination for vice president. And I am told she is going to embrace that history and how she got here, the fact that her parents are immigrants who came to this country and fought with the civil rights movement. And then she's, of course, someone who served as the attorney general of California. She's going to prosecute the case against President Trump. She will say in one excerpt, Donald Trump's failure of leadership has cost lives and livelihood, and she will call this an inflection point. Savannah and Lester. All right, Kristen, thank you. Let's turn now to NBC News White House correspondent Peter Alexander. He's in Philadelphia tonight, where Barack Obama will be speaking just moments from now. Peter, you've got a little more uh, for us about the Biden campaign strategy for taking on Donald Trump. What are you hearing? Yeah, that's exactly right. One well, advance of hearing from Joe Biden tomorrow again, we'll hear from President Obama as he sort of cast the two things that a president is responsible for doing. One, protecting Americans, making the point that more than 170,000 have died in this pandemic, describing him, in fact, as a failure in his remarks tonight, and also talking about the president's duty to be a custodian of the democracy, hopefully to hand it over in better shape than you received it. There will be some stinging, some blistering statements from President Obama tonight, among other things saying that President Trump has shown no interest in treating this presidency as anything other than a reality show to get the attention that he so badly craves, Lester and Savannah. All right, All right. Peter and uh, Barack Obama, who first came to fame at a convention speech in 2004, a lifetime ago in politics, now a retired two-term president, making the case for his vice president. And we'll listen to that speech as it gets underway from the Museum evening, in Philadelphia. Everybody. As you've seen by now, this isn't a normal convention. It's not a normal time. So tonight, I want to talk as plainly as I can about the stakes in this election. Because what we do these next 76 days will echo through generations to come. 
I'm in Philadelphia, where our Constitution was drafted and signed. It wasn't a perfect document. It allowed for the inhumanity of slavery and failed to guarantee women, and even men who didn't own property, the right to participate in the political process. But embedded in this document was a North Star that would guide future generations. A system of representative government, a democracy, through which we could better realize our highest ideals. Through civil war and bitter struggles, we improved this Constitution to include the voices of those who'd once been left out. And gradually, we made this country more just and more equal and more free. The one constitutional office elected by all of the people is the presidency. So at a minimum, we should expect a president to feel a sense of responsibility for the safety and welfare of all 330 million of us, regardless of what we look like, how we worship, who we love, how much money we have, or who we voted for. But we should also expect a president to be the custodian of this democracy. We should expect that regardless of ego, ambition, or political beliefs, the president will preserve, protect, and defend the freedoms and ideals that so many Americans marched for, went to jail for, fought for, and died for. I have sat in the Oval Office with both of the men who are running for president. I never expected that my successor would embrace my vision or continue my policies. I did hope, for the sake of our country, that Donald Trump might show some interest in taking the job seriously, that he might come to feel the weight of the office and discover some reverence for the democracy that had been placed in his care. But he never did. For close to four years now, he has shown no interest in putting in the work, no interest in finding common ground, no interest in using the awesome power of his office to help anyone but himself and his friends, no interest in treating the presidency as anything but one more reality show that he can use to get the attention he craves. Donald Trump hasn't grown into the job because he can't. And the consequences of that failure are severe. 170,000 Americans dead. Millions of jobs gone, while those at the top take in more than ever. Our worst impulses unleashed, our proud reputation around the world badly diminished, and our democratic institutions threatened like never before. Now, I know that in times as polarized as these, most of you have already made up your mind. But maybe you're still not sure which candidate you'll vote for, or whether you'll vote at all. Maybe you're tired of the direction we're headed, but you can't see a better path yet, or you just don't know enough about the person who wants to lead us there. So let me tell you about my friend, Joe Biden. Twelve years ago, when I began my search for a vice president, I didn't know I'd end up finding a brother. Joe and I come from different places, different generations, but what I quickly came to admire about Joe Biden is his resilience, born of too much struggle, his empathy, born of too much grief. Joe is a man who learned early on to treat every person he meets with respect and dignity, living by the words his parents taught him. No one's better than you, Joe, but you're better than nobody. That empathy, that decency, the belief that everybody counts, that's who Joe is. 
When he talks with someone who's lost her job, Joe remembers the night his father sat him down to say that he'd lost his. When Joe listens to a parent who's trying to hold it all together right now, he does it as a single dad who took the train back to Wilmington each and every night so he could tuck his kids into bed. When he meets with military families who've lost their hero, he does it as a kindred spirit, the parent of an American soldier, somebody whose faith has endured the hardest loss there is. For eight years, Joe was the last one in the room whenever I faced a big decision. He made me a better president, and he's got the character and the experience to make us a better country. And in my friend Kamala Harris, he's chosen an ideal partner who is more than prepared for the job, someone who knows what it's like to overcome barriers and who's made a career fighting to help others live out their own American dream. Along with the experience needed to get things done, Joe and Kamala have concrete policies that will turn their vision of a better, fairer, stronger country into reality. They will get this pandemic under control, like Joe did when he helped me manage H1N1 and prevent an Ebola outbreak from reaching our shores. They'll expand health care to more Americans, like Joe and I did 10 years ago when he helped craft the Affordable Care Act and nail down the votes to make it the law. They'll rescue the economy, like Joe helped me do after the Great Recession. I asked him to manage the Recovery Act, which jump-started the longest stretch of job growth in history. And he sees this moment now not as a chance to get back to where we were, but to make long overdue changes so that our economy actually makes life a little easier for everybody. Whether it's the waitress trying to raise a kid on her own, or the shift worker always on the edge of getting laid off, or the student figuring out how to pay for next semester's classes. Joe and Kamala will restore our standing in the world. And as we've learned from this pandemic, that matters. Joe knows the world, and the world knows him. He knows that our true strength comes from setting an example that the world wants to follow, a nation that stands with democracy, not dictators, a nation that can inspire and mobilize others to overcome threats like climate change and terrorism, poverty and disease. But more than anything, what I know about Joe, what I know about Kamala, is that they actually care about every American, and that they care deeply about this democracy. They believe that in a democracy, the right to vote is sacred, and we should be making it easier for people to cast their ballots, not harder. They believe that no one, including the president, is above the law, and that no public official, including the president, should use their office to enrich themselves or their supporters. They understand that in this democracy, the commander-in-chief does not use the men and women of our military who are willing to risk everything to protect our nation as political props to deploy against peaceful protesters on our own soil. They understand that political opponents aren't un-American just because they disagree with you. A free press isn't the enemy, but the way we hold officials accountable. That our ability to work together to solve big problems like a pandemic depend on a fidelity to facts and science and logic and not just making stuff up. None of this should be controversial. These shouldn't be Republican principles or Democratic principles. They are American principles. But at this moment, this president and those who enable him have shown they don't believe in these things. 
Tonight, I'm asking you to believe in Joe and Kamala's ability to lead this country out of these dark times and build it back better. But here's the thing. No single American can fix this country alone. Not even a president. Democracy was never meant to be transactional. You give me your vote, I make everything better. It requires an active and informed citizenry. So I'm also asking you to believe in your own ability to embrace your own responsibility as citizens, to make sure that the basic tenets of our democracy endure, because that's what's at stake right now, our democracy. Look, I understand why a lot of Americans are down on government. The way the rules have been set up and abused in Congress make it easier for special interests to stop progress than to make progress. Believe me, I, I know it. I understand why a white factory worker who's seen his wages cut or his job shipped overseas might feel like the government no longer looks out for him, and why a black mom might feel like it never looked out for her at all. I understand why a new immigrant might look around this country and wonder whether there's still a place for him here. Why a young person might look at politics right now, the circus of it all, the meanness and the lies and conspiracy theories, and think, what is the point? Well, here's the point. This president and those in power those who benefit from keeping things the way they are, they are counting on your cynicism. They know they can't win you over with their policies. So they're hoping to make it as hard as possible for you to vote and to convince you that your vote does not matter. That is how they win. That is how they get to keep making decisions that affect your life and the lives of the people you love. That's how the economy will keep getting skewed to the wealthy and well-connected. How our health systems will let more people fall through the cracks. That's how a democracy withers, until it's no democracy at all. And we cannot let that happen. Do not let them take away your power. Do not let them take away your democracy. Make a plan right now for how you are going to get involved and vote. Do it as early as you can and tell your family and friends how they can vote too. Do what Americans have done for over two centuries when faced with even tougher times than this. All those quiet heroes who found the courage to keep marching, keep pushing in the face of hardship and injustice. Last month, we lost a giant of American democracy in John Lewis. And some years ago, I sat down with John and a few remaining leaders of the early civil rights movement. One of them told me he never imagined he'd walk into the White House and see a president who looked like his grandson. And then he told me that he had looked it up. And it turned out that on the very day that I was born, he was marching into a jail cell, trying to end Jim Crow segregation in the South. What we do echoes through generations. Whatever our backgrounds, we are all the children of Americans who fought the good fight, great grandparents, working in fire traps and sweatshops without rights or representation. Farmers losing their dreams to dust. Irish and Italians and Asians and Latinos told, go back where you come from. Jews and Catholics, Muslims and Sikhs made to feel suspect for the way they worshiped. Black Americans chained and whipped and hanged, spit on for trying to sit at lunch counters, beaten 
for trying to vote. If anyone had a right to believe that this democracy did not work and could not work, it was those Americans, our ancestors. They were on the receiving end of a democracy that had fallen short all their lives. They knew how far the daily reality of America strayed from the myth. And yet, instead of giving up, they joined together. And they said, somehow, some way, we are going to make this work. We are going to bring those words in our founding documents to life. I have seen that same spirit rising these past few years. Folks of every age and background who packed city centers and airports and rural roads so that families wouldn't be separated, so that another classroom wouldn't get shot up, so that our kids won't grow up on an uninhabitable planet. Americans of all races joining together to declare in the face of injustice and brutality at the hands of the state that black lives matter. No more, but no less. So that no child in this country feels the continuing sting of racism. To the young people who led us this summer, telling us we need to be better, in so many ways, you are this country's dreams fulfilled. Earlier generations had to be persuaded that everyone has equal worth. For you, it's a given, a conviction. And what I want you to know is that for all its messiness, and frustrations, your system of self-government can be harnessed to help you realize those convictions for all of us. You can give our democracy new meaning. You can take it to a better place. You're the missing ingredient the ones who will decide whether or not America becomes the country that fully lives up to its creed. That work will continue long after this election. But any chance of success depends entirely on the outcome of this election. This administration has shown it will tear our democracy down if that's what it takes for them to win. So we have to get busy building it up by pouring all our efforts into these 76 days and by voting like never before for Joe and Kamala and candidates up and down the ticket so that we leave no doubt about what this country that we love stands for today and for all our days to come. Stay safe. God bless. Barack Obama setting the stage for Kamala Harris's uh, nomination. She will take the stage. Savannah, I just note, uh, he talked about, certainly about Joe Biden. He made me a better president. He took his shots at Donald Trump, but mostly this was a speech about democracy. And what a setting in Philadelphia, the city of our founding, the 1776 Declaration of Independence, the museum that holds those documents. There he was saying in the starkest terms, do not let them take away your democracy. So President Obama giving about 15 minutes of a speech, and now the night turns over to Kamala Harris, the VP nominee, and the official business is about to get underway. We're going to watch it on the DNC. This will start with the, uh, the, the, the nomination process. Yeah, we'll hear from the chair of the convention, and then we'll see some relatives of Kamala Harris, her sister, her niece, and her stepdaughter. The majority of all pledged and automatic delegates will nominate the Democratic candidate for vice president. In accordance with our rules, Vice President Biden has nominated Senator Kamala Harris as his vice presidential candidate. 
Our rules further provide that if only one candidate is nominated for vice president, the chair is authorized to declare the nominee the Democratic candidate for vice president. As such, with only one nomination received and pursuant to our rules, I hereby declare that Kamala Harris is elected as the Democratic candidate for vice president. I'm pleased to report that vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris has been invited to deliver an acceptance speech. Kamala Harris is my auntie. My stepmom. My big sister. Which means you'll always be my older sister. And there are some things we'd like to share with you. To my brother and me, you'll always be Mamala, the world's greatest stepmom. You're my role model, who taught me I could do and be anything I wanted. My very first friend, my confidant, my partner in mischief and in justice. You're a rock, not just for our dad, but for three generations of our big blended family. You showed me the importance of public service and made sure I grew up surrounded by smart, strong, ambitious women every day. Growing up, heaven help the poor kid who picked on me because my big sister would be there in a flash, ready to have my back. Well, now we've got your back as you and Joe fight to protect our democracy. And there's no union more perfect than the one that brings us all to your kitchen table every Sunday night for stir fry, feta chicken, or spaghetti and meatball family dinners. And now that I'm a mom, you're showing my daughters and so many girls around the world who look like them what's possible and what it's like to move through the world as fierce, formidable, phenomenal women in their own unique way. I love you. I admire you. I am so proud of you. And even though mommy's not here to see her first daughter step into history, the entire nation will see in your strength, your integrity, your intelligence, and your optimism, the values that she raised us with. We love you, Mamala. We're so proud of you, Auntie. You mean the world to us, Kamala. And we could not be more excited to share you with the world as the next, as the next Vice President. Vice President of the United States. Joe Biden has selected Kamala Harris as his running mate. She is the first black woman, first South Asian woman to be named on the Democratic ticket. This is a historic pick. Let's go! Someone who looks like us on a presidential ticket. That's crazy. Kamala Harris is us. She was born in Oakland. The daughter of immigrants. The daughter of Shangla. Big sister and protector. She is an HBCU grad. She is a woman of many firsts. Ella reconoce el trabajo duro. She's a hard worker, a really hard worker. She's brilliant, she's smart, she's tough, and she's got a big future. She's probably one of the best role models. Come on, Harris is like a dream to me. Senator Harris cares about people. There's no doubt about it. When she says for the people, it is every ounce of who she is. She's for us. She's for us. She fights for women's rights. She fights to end mass incarceration. of the United States. (gasps) 
Greetings, America. It is truly an honor to be speaking with you tonight. That I am here tonight is a testament to the dedication of generations before me, women and men who believed so fiercely in the promise of equality, liberty, and justice for all. This week marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, and we celebrate the women who fought for that right. Yet so many of the black women who helped secure that victory were still prohibited from voting long after its ratification. But they were undeterred. Without fanfare or recognition, they organized and testified and rallied and marched and fought, not just for their vote, but for a seat at the table. These women and the generations that followed worked to make democracy and opportunity real in the lives of all of us who followed. They paved the way for the trailblazing leadership of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And these women inspired us to pick up the torch and fight on. Women like Mary Church Terrell, Mary Cloyd Bethune, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Diane Nash, Constance Baker Motley, and the great Shirley Chisholm. We're not often taught their stories. But as Americans, we all stand on their shoulders. And there's another woman whose name isn't known, whose story isn't shared, another woman whose shoulders I stand on. And that's my mother, Shamala Gopalan Harris. She came here from India at age 19 to pursue her dream of curing cancer. At the University of California, Berkeley, she met my father, Donald Harris, who had come from Jamaica to study economics. They fell in love in that most American way while marching together for justice in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. In the streets of Oakland and Berkeley, I got a stroller's eye view of people getting into what the great John Lewis called good trouble. When I was five, my parents split, and my mother raised us mostly on her own. Like so many mothers, she worked around the clock to make it work, packing lunches before we woke up and paying bills after we went to bed, helping us with homework at the kitchen table and shuttling us to church for choir practice. She made it look easy, though it never was. My mother instilled in my sister Maya and me the values that would chart the course of our lives. She raised us to be proud, strong black women. And she raised us to know and be proud of our Indian heritage. She taught us to put family first, the family you're born into, and the family you choose. Family is my husband, Doug, who I met on a blind date set up by my best friend. Family is our beautiful children, Cole and Ella, who call me Mamala. Family is my sister. Family is my best friend, my nieces, and my godchildren. Family is my uncles, my aunts, and my chitties. Family is Mrs. Shelton, my second mother who lived two doors down and helped raise me. Family is my beloved Alpha Kappa Alpha, our divine nine, and my HBCU brothers and sisters. Family is the friends I turn to when my mother, the most important person in my life, passed away from cancer. And even as she taught us to keep our family at the center of our world, she also pushed us to see a world beyond ourselves. She taught us to be conscious and compassionate about the struggles of all people, to believe public service is a noble cause and the fight for justice is a shared responsibility. That led me to become a lawyer. 
a district attorney, attorney general, and a United States senator. And at every step of the way, I've been guided by the words I spoke from the first time I stood in a courtroom. Kamala Harris for the people. I have fought for children and survivors of sexual assault. I fought against transnational criminal organizations. I took on the biggest banks and helped take down one of the biggest for-profit colleges. I know a predator when I see one. My mother taught me that service to others gives life purpose and meaning. And oh, how I wish she were here tonight, but I know she's looking down on me from above. I keep thinking about that 25-year-old Indian woman, all of five feet tall, who gave birth to me at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California. On that day, she probably could have never imagined that I would be standing before you now and speaking these words. I accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States of America. I do so committed to the values she taught me, to the word that teaches me to walk by faith and not by sight, and to a vision passed on through generations of Americans, one that Joe Biden shares, a vision of our nation as a beloved community, where all are welcome, no matter what we look like, no matter where we come from or who we love. A country where we may not agree on every detail, but we are united by the fundamental belief that every human being is of infinite worth, deserving of compassion, dignity, and respect. A country where we look out for one another, where we rise and fall as one, where we face our challenges and celebrate our triumphs together. Today, that country feels distant. Donald Trump's failure of leadership has cost lives and livelihoods. If you're a parent struggling with your child's remote learning, or you're a teacher struggling on the other side of that screen, you know what we're doing right now is not working. And we are a nation that is grieving, grieving the loss of life, the loss of jobs, the loss of opportunities, the loss of normalcy, and yes, the loss of certainty. And while this virus touches us all, we got to be honest, it is not an equal opportunity offender. Black, Latino, and indigenous people are suffering and dying disproportionately. And this is not a coincidence. It is the effect of structural racism, of inequities in education and technology, health care and housing, job security and transportation, the injustice in reproductive and maternal health care, in the excessive use of force by police, and in our broader criminal justice system. This virus, it has no eyes, and yet it knows exactly how we see each other and how we treat each other. And let's be clear, there is no vaccine for racism. We've got to do the work for George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for the lives of too many others to name, for our children, and for all of us. We've got to do the work to fulfill that promise of equal justice under law. Because here's the thing, none of us are free until all of us 
are free. So we're at an inflection point. The constant chaos leaves us adrift. The incompetence makes us feel afraid. The callousness makes us feel alone. It's a lot. And here's the thing. We can do better and deserve so much more. We must elect a president who will bring something different, something better, and do the important work. A president who will bring all of us together, black, white, Latino, Asian, indigenous, to achieve the future we collectively want. We must elect Joe Biden. And I will tell you, I knew Joe as vice president. I knew Joe on the campaign trail. And I first got to know Joe as the father of my friend. So Joe's son, Bo, and I served as attorneys general of our states, Delaware and California. During the Great Recession, he and I spoke on the phone nearly every day, working together to win back billions of dollars for homeowners from the big banks that foreclosed on people's homes. And Bo and I, we would talk about his family, how as a single father, Joe would spend four hours every day riding the train back and forth from Wilmington to Washington. Bo and Hunter got to have breakfast every morning with their dad. They went to sleep every night with the sound of his voice reading bedtime stories. And while they endured an unspeakable loss, those two little boys always knew that they were deeply, unconditionally loved. And what also moved me about Joe is the work that he did as he was going back and forth. This is the leader who wrote the Violence Against Women Act and enacted the assault weapons ban, who as vice president implemented the Recovery Act, which brought our country back from the Great Recessions. He championed the Affordable Care Act, protecting millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions who spent decades promoting American values and interests around the world. Joe, he believes we stand with our allies and stand up to our adversaries. Right now, we have a president who turns our tragedies into political weapons. Joe will be a president who turns our challenges into purpose. Joe will bring us together to build an economy that doesn't leave anyone behind, where a good paying job is the floor, not the ceiling. Joe will bring us together to end this pandemic and make sure that we are prepared for the next one. Joe will bring us together to squarely face and dismantle racial injustice, furthering the work of generations. Joe and I believe that we can build that beloved community, one that is strong and decent, just and kind, one in which we can all see ourselves. That's the vision that our parents and grandparents fought for, the vision that made my own life possible, the vision that makes the American promise for all its complexities and imperfections a promise worth fighting for. So make no mistake, the road ahead is not easy. We may stumble, we may fall short, but I pledge to you that we will act boldly and deal with our challenges honestly. We will speak truths and we will act with the same faith in you that we ask you to place in us. We believe 
that our country, all of us, will stand together for a better future. And we already are. We see it in the doctors, the nurses, the home health care workers and frontline workers who are risking their lives to save people they've never met. We see it in the teachers and truck drivers, the factory workers and farmers, the postal workers and poll workers, all putting their own safety on the line to help us get through this pandemic. And we see it in so many of you who are working, not just to get us through our current crisis, but to somewhere better. There's something happening all across our country. It's not about Joe or me. It's about you. And it's about us. People of all ages and colors and creeds who are, yes, taken to the streets, and also persuading our family members, rallying our friends, organizing our neighbors, and getting out the vote. And we have shown that when we vote, we expand access to health care and expand access to the ballot box and ensure that more working families can make a decent living. And I'm so inspired by a new generation. You, you are pushing us to realize the ideals of our nation, pushing us to live the values we share, decency and fairness, justice and love. You are patriots who remind us that to love our country is to fight for the ideals of our country. In this election, we have a chance to change the course of history. We're all in this fight. You, me, and Joe, together. What an awesome responsibility. What an awesome privilege. So let's fight with conviction. Let's fight with hope. Let's fight with confidence in ourselves and a commitment to each other, to the America we know is possible, the America we love. And years from now, this moment will have passed and our children and our grandchildren will look in our eyes and they're going to ask us, where were you when the stakes were so high? They will ask us, what was it like? And we will tell them. We will tell them not just how we felt. We will tell them what we did. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Kamala Harris at the Chase Convention Center in Wilmington, Delaware, and in an empty convention hall. Everything that a convention has, a soaring speech, a nominee, but not the people. But here she is introducing herself to America with her speech first as the official vice presidential nominee, and you see some of the folks Zoom watching press. on Zoom. <laughs> this is very, very 2020, um, as she says thank you to the folks who were watching at home. She guided through a, a, a really long period of reintroducing herself, which many believe was kind of the goal tonight. You know, we've known her as the presidential candidate. We've seen her in some of those more contentious hearings on Capitol Hill. But this was her moment to come out and really tell America who she was. We learned a lot about her life story, where her values came from, her, her family. And uh, 
There's Joe Biden. We had another convention tradition. Uh, the, the nominee, the candidate comes out. They're socially distanced, though. Uh, no hugs, no handshakes, but there he is, and they're waving to whoever is assembled in this convention hall. They're saying hello to the folks on Zoom. I want to bring in Valerie Jarrett, who served eight years in the Obama administration, who's been listening in with us tonight. Valerie, uh, we keep mentioning, you can't, can't say it enough, it's a convention like no other. But not just because it's happening in a pandemic. There's her husband, Doug Emhoff, by the way, and Dr. Jill Biden. Not just because it's in a pandemic, but also because this is a candidate who makes history. The first black woman on a major party ticket, Valerie. Well, that's right. And she said the American promise is a promise worth fighting for. And her life, Savannah, has been living out that promise. The hard work, the grit, the resilience, the determination. Her story, a daughter of immigrants, is the American story. And he just knocked it out of the ballpark tonight. Wow. What a night. All right, Valerie, thank you very much. We are going to take a short break here and be back with some final thoughts and a look ahead of Joe Biden's big night when we continue in just a moment. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A country reeling from a pandemic and racial injustice. The story changes hourly. The president's push to get children back into school is sinking in among families who are debating the safety of it. It's the 11th hour. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. All right, let's get some final thoughts from uh, Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, that uh, last half hour was quite fascinating. It was, it was extraordinary. Uh, Kamala Harris defining herself, saying how she was raised to be a strong black woman and that Donald Trump is costing lives and livelihoods, and the unprecedented attack by Barack Obama on his predecessor is something that he had resisted doing until John Lewis's funeral, but he really came out tonight against Donald Trump. 
Pretty amazing, but he said democracy is at stake. Yeah, Andrea, thanks. And so with night three now over, the stage is set for the final night of this convention. It will belong to Joseph R. Biden Jr. 36 years as a U.S. senator, eight years as vice president, and tomorrow, perhaps the biggest night yet of his political life, Joe Biden will accept the Democrat not the Democratic nomination for president. We will have it all for you. Until then, for Savannah, myself, Chuck, and Andrea, and all of us at NBC News, thank you for joining us. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Good night, everyone.